bow to my left. Honorable members, colleagues, let's observe a sudden prayer or meditation. Thank you. Honorable delegates, before we proceed, I would like to remind you the following. The visual sitting constitutes a sitting of the National Council of Provinces. The place of the sitting is deemed to be Cape Town, where the seat of the National Council of Provinces is. Delegates in the visual sitting enjoy the same powers, privileges that apply in the city of the National Council of Provinces. For purposes of the quorum, all delegates who are logged on to the virtual platform shall be considered present. Delegates must switch on their videos if they want to speak. Delegates should ensure that microphone on their gadgets are muted and must always remain muted. The interpretation facility is active. Permanent delegates, members of the executive, special delegates, SAGA representatives are requested to ensure that the interpretation facility on their gadgets are properly activated to facilitate access to the interpretation services. Any delegate who wishes to speak must use the raise hand function. Any delegate who wishes to raise a point of order should, in accordance with the rule 69 subsection 3, indicate terms of which rule he or she is arising. Honorable delegates, I've been informed that there will be no notices of motion or motion without notice. Honorable delegates, before we proceed for the first order, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the Acting Minister of Public Service and Administration, Deputy Minister of Public, uh, uh, the, the Minister, Acting Minister, let's see, Deputy Minister of Public uh, Service and Administration, MSC, and all special delegates present to their house. Honorable delegates, we'll now proceed to the first order policy debate on budget vote two, Parliamentary Appropriation B2. I will now call upon the Honorable uh, Masondo, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, to open the debate. Ndate Masondo. We are muted, Chairperson. We are muted. Yes, no, thank you very much. Yeah, you're fine now. Uh, now greetings to, to everybody. Uh, Deputy Chairperson of uh, the National Council of Provinces, um, Honorable uh, House Chairpersons and Chief Whip of Council, uh, Honorable Permanent and Special Delegates, ministers, ministers and Deputy Ministers on the platform, representative of South African Local Government Association, ladies and gentlemen, uh, program director, um, uh, uh, most of, of the time, after every storm, there is a, a rainbow. Having emerged from two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now better positioned to intensify the work of, of parliament and to consolidate the gains we have made so far under our democratic um, order. Parliament is, is an organ of, of, of people's power and a critical instrument for the transformation of our society. Yes, we felt the impact of the pandemic, the shocks caused by the July 2021 unrest, 
the fire damage done to our own buildings of parliament and the damage wrought uh, by the heavy rains flooding in at least uh, three of our provinces recently. As has been said before, life's roughest storms prove the strength of our anchors. While these disasters wreak havoc, cause the loss of many lives, they've also given us the opportunity to build back better. On the overview of the work of the NCOP, House Chairperson, the resumption of our physical work in the provinces evidenced by the Provincial Week Program is a signal of our readiness to build again. The following forms part of the work we undertook representing the interests of the provinces and supporting municipalities in the previous financial year. We processed and adopted 19 bills looking, amongst other things, at the impact uh, of the provinces. We processed 42 reports from committees, including reports on the allocation of national waste revenue to the three spheres of government. We dealt with the 12 interventions by the provinces and the municipalities the national government began a, a phase the process of pulling out from the northwest while ensuring continued support. We recorded and followed up on 64 executive undertakings. We convened and followed up on some of the issues which emanated from the 10 ministerial briefings we held, which focused on the matters of national importance. We held the executive to account through a total of 865 oral and written questions, 670 of which were answered by the end of March this year. We led together with the National Assembly, the sectoral parliament, parliament program to unlock opportunities for social economic advancement. A critical development in this regard which the Deputy Chairperson Honorable Lucas will elaborate on, is the deepening of our effort to empower women. Of course, we must do more. On key achievements in the past financial year, the previous, previous financial year occurred during the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the country and the world continue to face the sketch of this pandemic, Parliament proved its resilience. On lawmaking, Chairperson, Parliament's lawmaking mandate was successfully executed. Key amount of legislation we dealt with related to the national budget, which, amongst other things, focused on spending priorities and set out the details on how government intends to address the developmental needs of the public. Furthermore, Upon the assessment of electoral amendment bill in February already, we requested more time beyond the June 2022 deadline to do more justice to this important legislation. On oversight, as an activist uh, People's Parliament, we continue to strengthen measures aimed at ensuring greater accountability and oversight over the exam the executive. The parliamentary committee held, held 1,270 individual meetings, conducted budget reviews, and monitored the implementation of legislation. Parliamentary committees also embarked on 40 oversight visits and conducted 155 public hearings on different uh, bills. Both houses held sittings that dealt with the debates on issues of national importance, reports, policy, and bills. On public participation, with the graduate 
lifting of the COVID-19 restrictions, we have now begun to use physical meetings to interact with the public. On cooperative governance, South Jefferson, the state needs uh, to address apparent weaknesses in planning, which include the lack of alignment of, of plans in the different spheres of government. The challenges that have been brought to the attention of the NCOP include, among others, the following. That there is insufficient evidence-based planning. That there is fragmentation of the planning system and inadequate alignment and coherence across three spheres. And that at times, a plethora of ineffective intergovernmental forums are established. While pursuing the resolution of these challenges, we cannot overemphasize the importance of, of cooperation and proper coordination in the planning and implementation of government policies and programs. The workshop on cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations, hosted by the NSOP in February this year, went a long way in equipping us for our oversight role in this regard. On international engagement, a number of our challenges as a nation can only be addressed through improved international and cooperation. For example, risks such as the infectious diseases, climate action failure, extreme weather patterns, biodiversity loss, geoeconomic confrontation, debt crisis, trade barriers, cyber security features, and natural resources crisis will all require greater cooperation and collaboration at a global level. As such, we continue to use international fora to deal with these challenges and more. We will continue to take advantage of the improving conditions for physical engagement in the, in the conduct of parliamentary During 2021, parliament continues with its work on regional, continental, and international platforms. The engagement included the 49th Southern African Development Communities Parliamentary Forum Plenary Assembly, the fourth ordinary session of Pan African Parliament, the 143rd Interparliamentary Union Assembly, the seventh Parliamentary Speaker Summit, the 51st Commonwealth Parliamentary Association CPA Conference. As we speak, we are part of the CPA Africa Region Conference taking place here in, in Freetown, Sierra, Sierra Leone. African development remains the central objective of South Africa's international perspective and policy. On audit outcomes, Parliament continued to achieve a clean audit for the seventh consecutive year. Worth noting is that despite the, the declining scale caused by deteriorating economic conditions, the control environment remains, uh, remains strong as the audit committee, internal audit, and risk management capacity progressively improved. On the Parliamentary Institute, to accelerate the development of the human capital in December last year, the South African legislative sector launched the South African Parliamentary Institute. We hope that its board of directors, amongst them, amongst them the deputies of our two houses, will help steer this important initiative in the right direction. Policy priority on policy priorities of the sixth parliament, House Chairperson, improving the quality of life of South Africans remains our ultimate goal. In pursuing this societal impact, government developed a uh, the government developed the National Development Plan, which sets out how quality of life will be improved by 2030. The plan reflects the objectives and measures to increase employment, eradicate poverty, and reduce inequality. The Medium Term Strategic Framework, MTSF, for the 2019-2024 electoral period, elaborates government's plan towards achievement of goals set out in the NDP. The following are some of the priorities, building a capable, ethical, and developmental state, economic transformation and job creation, education, skills, and health, spatial integration, human settlement and local government, a better Africa, and a better world. 
The six parliamentary strategy and other performance, 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 performance plan has set out the required change initiative, which include the following an oversight, oversight plan to coordinate oversight priorities and activities of committees, houses, and, and legislatures, a public participation strategy to enhance public information access and participation, a knowledge management strategy to manage information and, and knowledge for the benefit of members, the institution, and stakeholders, the digital strategy to allow the implementation of modern technology, a human resource strategy to unleash capacity and skills, and a facilities management strategy to build and modernize the, prince, uh, the precinct of parliament. On Parliament uh, 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 Budget Vote 2, House Chairperson, the 2022-2023 budget for Parliament is set against the backdrop of declining budgets in the state as a, as a whole. The present downward trend is, is forecast to continue during the medium term. In dealing with current budget shortfalls, we are assisted by the under-expenditure during the COVID-19 period. However, Without taking steps to correct the allocation or reduce expenditure, a significant budget shortfall could occur in the 2024-2025 financial year. Total budget is 2.7 billion rands. However, total allocation received from national treasury is 2.6 billion rands. The shortfall in the amount of 74 million rands will be funded through retained earnings and revenue of parliament. The three programs are, are to receive allocations as follows, administration, 776 million rand, legislation and oversight, 754 million rand, and associated services and transfer payments to political parties, 755 million rand. There are, of course, other pressures. They include inflation, which is expected to increase by more than 6 percent. The expected rise in the cost of, of our goods and services due to relieving of COVID-19 restrictions and funding for the effective functioning of the Parliament and the budget office. Therefore, Parliament will need to engage the National Treasury on the impending shortfalls. In conclusion, the financial resources available to Parliament are not sufficient to sustain the expenditure level seen in the pre-COVID-19 years. This poses challenges as we seek to ensure the sustainability, effectiveness, and efficiency of the institution. How shall President let me thank the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Leader of Government Business, the presiding uh, officers of Parliament and provincial legislatures for a great working relationship. The support of the Chairperson of the NCOP, Honorable uh, Lucas, the House Chairperson, Honorable Nyambi, and Honorable Nguenya, the Chief Whip of the NCOP, uh, Honorable Muhabi, Muhai, sorry, has been immense. We also saw the permanent and special delegates increasing their robustness uh, in the debates. The work of the acting Secretary to Parliament, Ms. Baby Chawa, speaks for itself. We thank her for holding the fort all these years, and we extend appreciation to the Secretary, to the NCOP Advocate, Dibedi Pindela, and the entire parliamentary administration for their support to, to this House. We are confident that the appointment of new Secretary to Parliament, Mr. Paul Le George, will help us to consolidate the gains we have made so far and to move to higher ground. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Nyambi. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Ndate Masondo. Uh, you have put the bar high in terms of the time. Hopefully other speakers will be like you and have speeches that will be according to their time allocated. Thank you very much, Chair of the NCOB, Ndate Masondo. I'll now invite Honorable uh, Prudence. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. <clears throat> Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Member, fellow South Africans. It is common cause that the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa forms the basis of our democracy. 
It is not only the cornerstone and foundation of our country, but also the roof under which we shelter and are protected. It is therefore a priceless asset that should be protected at all costs. Parliament is the primary protector of the Constitution alongside the Constitutional Court. To this end, the institution conducts its business in line with the following values. Openness, responsiveness, accountability, teamwork, professionalism, and integrity. We have, however, seen a steady erosion of the budget allocated to Parliament to the point where the five programmes that used to drive budget expenditure in Parliament have been dramatically reduced to only three programmes. We are now left with administration, legislation and oversight, and associated services. The programmes that have been removed are strategic leadership and governance and core business. The Zondo Commission has strongly criticised the strategic and governance of Parliament, leadership and governance of Parliament, and so it is conceivable that, under a cloud of embarrassment, this government has moved this programme into the shadows until one day it, recovers its, it rediscovers its moral compass. But what of the other orphan child, the core business programme? What is the core business of Parliament? In short, it is procedural and legal advice, analysis, information and research, language, content, and secretariat legislative drafting services for meeting of the National Assembly, the National Council of Provinces, and their committees. Public education, formation, and access to support public participation, analysis, advice, content, protocol, and other administrative support for parliamentary international engagements. It can be argued, members, that this programme is the most important, as it forms the intellectual backbone of Parliament. It is the foundation of knowledge that will help this House, which should be primarily focused on reviewing, amending or creating legislation that will find practical and effective purchase on the ground and amongst our people. Without this programme, this House is doomed to be the lackey of the National Assembly, rubber stamping its decisions and feverishly emulating their activities. The abandonment of this programme, core business, simply precludes this House from its core, constitutionally mandated function. The recent oversights of the flood-stricken areas of South Africa are a case in point. Whilst the National Assembly, me National Assembly members of that committee function to bring attention to the infrastructural and social work government must do to restore normality, the members of this House, the NCOP, should be considering what legislative amendments or innovations are necessary to plan for the plan for and mitigate future, ca future catastrophes. This is important work and should be our mandate, but it is cut off by the knees by removing a program that provides the research and expert facilities required for such a task. Instead, the budget allows for six uh, for six hundred and ninety four million rand for administration. Perhaps they were planning for Mr. George's demand of five, five million rand per year. Who knows? The fact is that more of the budget of Parliament is spent on administration and remuneration than anything else. These budgetary adjustments point to our steady erosion of the ability of this Parliament to protect our democracy. Whilst not oblivious to the contraction of the economy, and with that the painful exercise of tightening belts, the funding of core functions should be absolutely non-negotiable. Parliament is like a house, the shelter of our democracy. You may consider not painting it for a period of time or not upgrading the kitchen, but you should certainly always maintain the roof, the windows, and keep the foundation in tip-top condition. And you certainly would not install a new jacuzzi and then not pay the water bill. To illustrate this point, the distortion of priorities of our Parliament serving its administration and members, the institution recently embarked on a member satisfaction survey. The results of the survey found that 70% of the members were, on average, satisfied with the service they given to them. But this was based on a survey of 49 out of 490 members. The reason being is that Parliament insists on using parliamentary email addresses, which very few members use. The absurdity is plain for all to see. But Parliament, in our meetings, trumpets these results in every report, and they miss a fundamental point. The satisfaction survey of Parliament should be amongst the people of South Africa, not the members. Would the people of South Africa be happy with the inaction of Parliament throughout the Zuma years? The pandering visits during the Durban riots and the floods? The promise of, promise of one billion rand by Treasury that is evaporated like the mist before the morning sun? Would they be happy with our key performance indicator, the ability to hold the executive to account? 
No wonder Parliament was disrespected by the Mayor and Deputy Mayor Vitagrini in our recent floods oversight visit there. If we keep eroding our institution, it will become a paper tiger, not worthy of any respect. Simply put, Honourable Chairperson, we need to shift priorities. We need to focus on the core business of Parliament. We need to hire eager and fiery young researchers determined to hold the executive accountable, rather than third-rate researchers who simply summarise documents and provide inane comments that members know anyway. We need to use, use that research to change committee meetings from chummy engagements to tough inquisitorial hearings with structure and purpose, where no quarter is offered or given. We need to shift funds to making Parliament even more accessible to South Africans, with an additional channel on the public broadcast to, to screen our business to the people. All of the suggestions above, of course, rest on the premise that the governing party actually want Parliament to work. It does, however, appear that this ANC government is, however, quite content to let this fine institution slide down a slippery slope to the insignificant status of a lapdog to the executive. After all, we all know that the ANC comes first. It is time to protect the people of South Africa from this narcissistic organisation and, and restore the true constitutional purpose of Parliament. The DA is committed to that ideal and will fight tooth and nail for it. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Prudence. I now invite Honourable Mashangu. Honourable Mashangu. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson and Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, the Minister, Deputy Ministers uh, on the platform, MECs and speakers, permanent and special delegates, Saluka delegates. Chaba Seketu, Sesola Africa, Lochan. Chairperson, as the African National Congress enters this debate, we are conscious of the fact that a budget of parliament is about to whether the transformation project of parliament is on track and whether we have the necessary financial resources to take that project to a higher level over the next 12 months. The ANC orientation, therefore, is to transform the state machinery to serve the cause of social change. This is true of parliament as it is central to contributing to the democratic transition of our country as a tribune of the people. We are tasked to ensure that through our oversight and legislative role, there is a speedy rollout of meeting the needs of our people. That appropriate legislation that speaks directly to the needs of the people and will benefit them must be passed. Honorable Chairperson, our role is one which understand that oversight is a continuous act in which there is reinforcing work relationship between the, the legislature and the executive, ensuring that ANC government policies and programs are implemented effectively and efficiently. In assessing the work of the administration, its, its performance and programs, we are guided by Parliament's strategic plan of 2019 to 2024. Assessing performance means that we need to use indicators of which nine of the 12 indicators that Parliament use are new and do not have a benchmark established to ensure them. Honorable Chairperson, what we can say is that the strategic leadership and governance program has witnessed far greater progress. Coherency, coherency of the uh, office of the chairperson and the deputy chairperson of the council has been extremely helpful and the support structures that surround the office of the chair and the deputy. We have expressed ourselves at length over the past year on the matter of the parliamentary budget office. What is lacking is a reference group to advise the executive authority on areas of work, programmed research, and et cetera, given that it reports to the executive authority. Equally, the governance structures of the PBO needs to demonstrate far greater leadership and guidance. We welcome the appointment in the Treasury Advice Office and, add, and, and are and encouraged by the recent advisory support that is coming from this office. With this, with regard to the core business, 
program of parliament. We can only assess its performance in board, in board trends. The methodology of assessing performance in parliament is not a qualitative way of measuring performance. Instead of using a conventional way of measuring performance, we are given a model that is deeply flawed, that of member satisfaction. Until we to move back to a methodology that is standard qualitative way of assessing performance, all the 100% achieved and et cetera, will remain very follow, very follow. Honorable Chairperson, more attention needs to be given by parliament to ensure that members master the subject matter that they have oversight responsibility for. This means parliament needs to identify causes that will build capacity of committee members in their subject matters. In this way, parliament will be ensure will 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 ensure a qualitative higher level of oversight. It is it is insufficient for parliament in its core business program to say we seek to enhance oversight capacity when we when the evidence thereof is lacking. There are on advisory research and information service, services. We welcome the legal support that has been given to committees. We want to suggest that far more time is given to legal imp, I, interpretation. More advice in the area of legal interpretation is necessary, very necessary, not just legal explanation. Since this is well in litigation against uh, transformative legislation that we need to pass is contested. Honorable Chairperson, we have just emerged from the ANC caucus midterm review where we discussed at length moving parliament to an enhanced oversight model. Enhanced oversight is about a qualitative shift in the oversight approach to focus on outcomes and impact assessment. This is done through the use of appropriate oversight tools and indicators. For the ANC, the non-attainment of policy outcome and poor impact can be traced to the weakness of performance information and reporting. This leads to oversight structures being more reactive than proactive due to lack of relevant and strategic information. The fact that oversight is largely after the fact result in adequate monitoring and performance. The 2017-54th National Conference of the ANC on the oversight role of parliament noted that, I quote, the oversight role of parliament will be re-examined so as to ensure an ANC progressive consistent agenda is implemented in parliament. We want to ensure consistency and robustness of parliament's oversight role. In addition to existing oversight over the executive, parliament must also turn its attention to matters affecting broader society, close quote. Honorable Chairperson and fellow South African, the critical question is how we move oversight to outcomes and impact assessment. The legislative se sector oversight model is inadequate in this regard. Two things need to happen. Parliament must move towards an outcome-based uh, reporting system, not just target-based on light satisfaction. Currently, we have a parliament system geared towards outputs. In addition, enhanced oversight means oversight over implementation, which should be outcome and impact orientation. Honorable Chairperson, on the current matters before Parliament, which has an impact on the budget of Parliament, are the proposed amendment of the Financial Management Parliament and Provincial Legislature Act. We are very conscious that this pro, uh, process has been going on since 2017, and that the Speaker's Forum has an established position. Whilst the matter was referred in a sitting of the National Assembly to the Standing Committee on Finance, who originally initiated the bill back in 2005. The, implement, the implications for oversight requires that the Joint Standing Committee on Financial Management of Parliament needs to be involved. It is not the Standing Committee on Finance that has 
oversight authority on performance of parliament. On the budget of parliament, we have stated it before that the current arrangement is not only an sustainable and demanding to the institution demeaning to this institution of parliament we cannot be treated as a vote of funds rather parliament must be part of determining its budget internal priorities and alignment of its needs there are specific line items that uh, currently create the shortfalls in the budget of parliament this needs to be addressed before the February budget next year, when control of uh, when the, the estimates of uh, national expenditure are tabled. These matters are not with the control of parliament, but sit as line items in the budget of parliament without parliament having a say over the matters and are a major cause of the shortfall in the budget of uh, parliament. Honorable chairperson and honorable members, there are there, there are permits, travel uh, entitlements of former members of the executive, loss of office gratitude, and political party allowance. We call for the speedy resolution of these matters with the national treasury to enable parliament to have a budget that addresses the the actual needs of the institution members and the people of South Africa. Specifically, currently, the budget of parliament is determined through consultation with the National Treasury and the Executive Authority. This creates a challenge in the budget process and greater attention needs to be given to alignment um, of the budgetary calendars of both parliament and National Treasury. On PADMET, Honorable Chairperson, the reality is that there has been a 200% uh, incre increase in main members' contribution since 2008, yet the actual increase in the salaries of members is a fraction of this since 2008. Therefore, in real terms, members are getting a worse deal every year, and META is, and meta is just uh, compounding itself. It is grossly unfair for Parliament to have to fund the obligations related to previous members of provincial legislatures. Parliament must provide the National Treasury with a breakdown of the, of the permit responsibility so that the National Treasury can engage provincial legislatures about their responsibilities. On political party allowances, the problem statement lies in, in where the political party allowance funding responsibility should reside. Currently, it rests with parliament and there are con contradictions in this area. Besides where it should lie, the actual internal parliamentary formula has to be reviewed. On the matter of loss of uh, office gratuity, this places a huge strain on parliament's budget and will result at the end of the sixth parliament uh, result in a large outflow fund. Honorable Chairperson, the entity, uh, in this case, uh, Parliament, from which a matter finally exists, is liable for the full service of the member, irrespective of where they have served in government. Between 2009 and 2021, Parliament has paid out 273 million rands in the loss of office gratitude, gratitudes. It is recommended that a capping system be introduced on entitlement for former members of parliament and the executives. It is clear that new policy provision must prevail in order to reduce the current expenditure of 46 million rands last calculated between 2015 and 2020. In conclusion, honorable chairperson, um, the unsustainable expenditure levels coupled with the structure and composition of the parliament vote of funds added to the key risks and constraints and the budget reduction all require major interventions between now and 2023 budget. The Joint Standing Committee on Financial Management of, of Parliament must be seized with these 
with these uh, in, uh, 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 issues raised uh, going forward and that we look forward to seeing a qualitative change in the quarterly reports that will be tabled going forward. Without this change, we are on an, unsta an unstable path as we speak. Honorable Chairperson, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the ANC to support vote to parliament. I guess Togos is Togos about no besa, nabu so besa, ugu tibat ulise gusha maku abo, jongo ba iko sitabi, tosta Togos. Thank you. Sir, Sir Togos, uh, Honorable uh, Mashango, I'll now invite Honorable Zandamela. Sir Togosi. Uh, <coughs> Chairperson of the session, it will be Honorable Mletsane. No problem. Can you continue, Honorable Mletsane? Thank you, Chairperson of the session. Chairperson, the economic freedom fighters reject the proposed budget uh, for parliament. We reject the budget of parliament, which fails to fulfill its constitutional mandate of representing the interests of our people as well as the interests of, of the provinces in the national sphere of government. Section 55.2 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996, stipulates the role of parliament to oversee the activities of government and any organs of the state, so as to realize a better quality of life for all the people of South Africa. However, Parliament has been unable to fulfill its primary responsibility of holding the executive to account for the many challenges faced by our people. Instead, Parliament sits by and watches idly as the country continue on a downward spiral. And perhaps there exists no greater challenge than the higher unemployment crisis which we currently face. As we enter into Youth Month, we are faced with the stark reality of a youth which continues to bear the brand of unemployment with an unemployment rate higher than the national average. This irrespective of educational attainment, the, the high unemployment rate creates a perfect storm for other social ills such as crime, gender-based violence, and social unrest. We know this to be true as our crime continues to spiral at alarming rates. As in the Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape, Lusikisiki, Inanda, in KwaZulu Natal, and Delft in Western Cape, they recorded the highest uh, insist of rape for this uh, quota. The law is not enforced and there exists little uh, to no repercussion for those who break the law. The current condition of South Africa is of a society where thousands of people face severe problems in accessing even the most basic services such as health, water, sanitation, electricity, and refuse re uh, removal. And this house has been unable to hold the executive to account for their destructive actions and their role which they continue to play in pushing the country into a failed state. Members of parliament are continually caught between responding to the needs of the communities or their political parties. The reality being that Political needs often overweigh, the, overweigh those of the people. There exists a protective relationship with the ANC. Members of parliament use this house as opportunities to defend their corrupt ministers. And the truth of the matter stands that this parliament has become the greatest enabler of the looting and destruction that has been going on in this country for a while. This house has also failed to initiate and prepare legislation and there exists no plan to build state capacity. 
This House has failed to amend the Constitution to allow for land expropriation without compensation. It failed to amend the South African Reserve Bank Act to nationalize the central bank. It failed to amend the Bank Act of 1990 to allow state-owned companies to apply for a full commercial banking license. It has failed to amend the National Health Act to allow the clinics to, op to open 24 hours, and it failed to amend the Liquor Act to ban alcohol advertising. Parliament lacks capacity of, uh, to facilitate the development of all these bills, and it fails to listen to, to, reason, on, to reason on alternative methods of building capacity and preparing legislation by members of parliament. Parliament has faced so many challenges throughout the years that it has placed doubt on its primary function of passing legislation and overseeing the executive. It has failed to deliver the needs of communities. In a country of such, of so much uh, inequalities, unemployment, exploitation, and the general moral degeneration reflects by those who lead the state. As the EFF, we reject the budget of a parliament which sits by and watches and does nothing to challenge the condition of our people. We reject the budget of a parliament which failed to establish a joint steering committee to oversee the implementation of crime prevention measures with, speci with specific focus on gender-based violence. As the EFF has on many occasions requested, we reject, we reject the budget of a parliament which consistently refuses to take the increasing pandemic of rape and sexual assault seriously. Chairperson, we reject this budget. I'll now invite Honorable Lagoskafne. Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, the role of the NCOP as part of Parliament is spelled out in the supreme law of the country, the Constitution. Two of the main functions to present the interests of provinces in being a forum where issues affecting provinces are debated publicly and lawmaking. The strategic plan of Parliament determines three indicators to focus on, namely poverty, unemployment and inequality. It also defines seven ways of doing so. Due to time concerns, I'm, uh, con I am focusing on two of the most important ones. Increase account accountability by strengthening oversight over executive and oversight in general and increase public demand for greater involvement. The first concern about the aspirations of increased oversight is that the time allocated in the NCOP program framework to oversight visits for committees have been ironically reduced from two weeks to one. No explanation, no reasons given. Might be not to discover more of the same. Total collapsing of local governments as well as looting sprees of provincial and national government. Another function of oversight is to increase the responsiveness and accountability of Parliament. And how is it supposed to work? For one, feedback of oversight findings and recommendations must inform the strategic plans and budget for the next cycle. Well, the oversight reports are written, ATC and most of the time forgotten. The report on state capture, or the Zonder Commission report as we know it, clearly states the failure of Parliament in fulfilling its oversight role. We cannot get different outcomes and results in doing the same thing the very same way year after year. A quick glance at the number of interventions referred to the NCOP over the fifth and the sixth Parliament up till now reveals that 78 municipalities were referred for Section 139 interventions. Another nine has been referred, but not being decided on. That is 31% of municipalities. Is it not time that we have a dedicated select committee focusing on local government and interventions? Such a select committee should be more than a tool in the hands of the ANC to try and sort out factional fights. 
A dedicated committee for COCTA should focus on the cooperative and intergovernmental roles and functions of the provincial governments requesting these interventions, indicate the lack of support and help that should have been given by provinces or national government before interventions are being improved. And when improved, monitor and guide the process in such a way that it serves the citizens of that municipality with better services delivery, contributing to better lives. An in-depth look at our program will reveal the little time we've spent in this parliament on debates. The platform where we need to debate provincial or, in other words, issues that matter to the people in the public. One space where the minister should debate and not given presentations. Honourable Chair, the second as aspect of how to address the strategic plan indicators is increased public demand for involvement. Public involvement is most important in our lawmaking process, also spelled out in the Constitution. Section 76 bills can be introduced in the NCOP. Provincial interest can be addressed firsthand via public participation, even more so if the same amount of time that is being spent on bills in the NA then could be done in the NCOP as well. I am requesting and challenging the presiding officers and the WIPRI to take a stand, address the local, the LOGB and the premiers of provinces on this matter. The mandating act is, is does not provide clear guidelines, nor does the rules on exactly the manner in which proposed amendments should be dealt with in committees. The result is very few bills are being amended in the NCOP, despite the time and huge amount of money spent on public participation. The NCOP cannot claim that we really know what the impact of new legislation or policies are on the quality of life of our people. A good example of that is the court case on the small-scale fisheries policy. We only became aware, become aware of the impact when a high-level panel is appointed to do the job the NCOP should have done. Honourable Chair, it is clear that the only way poverty, unemployment and inequalities will be successfully addressed by Parliament is to change the ruling party of Parliament in 2024 elections. I thank you. Thank you. I'll now invite the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honourable Lucas. Thank you very much, Honourable House Chair. Uh, Nyambi, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, House Chairperson's Chief Whip of the National Council of Provinces, Permanent and Special Delegates, the Acting Minister, Minister Nresi, that is present on the platform, as well as the Deputy Minister, Pilani Majake, Acting Secretary to Parliament, Secretary to the NCOP, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Fellow South Africans. Chairperson, let me right at the beginning start. It is really an honor for me to have the opportunity to speak on the occasion on the tabling of the budget of parliament. The FAMPLA Act 10 of 2009 requires the executive authority to oversee the preparation of parliament's annual performance plan and budget. The proposed expenditure set out in vote two will support the execution of the six parliament strategy through our APP as well, tabled in June 2021. This plan specifies performance measures and indicators for assessing Parliament's performance in achieving the objectives and outcomes detailed in the straight plan. Chairperson, as we are tabling the budget, the African continent remains at a crossroads. The world is uncertain, volatile, dangerous, and indeed unjust. A number of international, political, and economic factors have shaped the contemporary world order Acting together, these factors have engendered growing uncertainty in the world and destabilized our global governance. In the context of increasingly open and contested markets that are a feature of the globalized international economy, competition from these influential emerging economies is regarded as a threat by many industrialist countries. In practical terms, this has been illustrated by growing opposition to further trade reforms in many countries and has been underlined by the failure to conclude the Doha round of multilateral trade negotiations. Chairperson, the World Economic Forum indicated that the coronavirus pandemic was not an outlier, but that is part of the new normal of our interconnected and viral world. 
epidemics will become more common with an increasingly connected world. These social risks risk will require more and better collaboration and cooperation on international and regional levels. Despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, Parliament's multi-party delegation to the 143rd IPU Assembly in Madrid in 2021 supported the IPU African Group's proposed resolution harnessing global parliamentary support for vaccine equity in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. In the discussion, parliamentarians pointed to a clear discrepancy between Africa and the rest of the world in the global rollout of vaccines. According to the World Bank and the World Health Organization, less than 2% of people living in Africa's low-income countries have been fully vaccinated, and less than 10% in lower middle-income countries. In comparison, over 60% of the population in advanced economies is vaccinated. The resolution called on the international community to ensure timely, equitable, and universal access to safe, affordable, quality, and effective vaccines with particular regard to the needs of low- and middle-income countries in the most affected regions like the Sadek region, and implored parliamentarians to work with their national governments to exert a global and collective influence on the World Trade Organization to eliminate all export restrictions and collective influence on the all and any other trade barriers on COVID-19 vaccines and the inputs involved in their production insisted on the fact that both national and international efforts to raise awareness regarding the effectiveness of vaccines, to engage communities and to reduce vaccine hesitancy are indispensable to attain a sufficient degree of immunization around the world and that considerably more efforts in this field are required. <laughs> Honorable members, collectively, though the above mentioned resolution was referred to the Portfolio Committee on Health for Action, particularly in engaging communities to reduce COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and on working with the national government to exert a global and collective influence on the WTO to eliminate all export restrictions and any other trade barriers on COVID-19 vaccines and the inputs involved in their production. Honorable members, collectively, we must continue to reject moves to politicize scientific research in the interest of an imperialist global agenda. In this era of pandemic, scientific collaborations across our globe is critical for progress and for the protection of humanity. Scientific fields of origins or source tracing of viruses is a critical instrument in the campaign against their spread. Chaperson, the strategy map of the six parliaments sets out our desired long-term impact. Improving quality of life is the ultimate goal and impact that parliament wishes to see. In pursuing this societal impact, government developed the NDP setting out our quality of life should be improved by 2030. The plan reflects objectives and measures to increase employment, eradicate poverty, and reduce inequality. The MTSF is government's strategic plan for the 2019 to 2024 electoral term. It stipulates the outcomes to be achieved, which includes high-level development indicators for each outcome. And there is where they have set out the seven priorities with related to outcomes and indicators. The development targets set out in the MTSF enable Parliament to monitor the progress of implementation and hence the overall impact on society, which is our role. It is Parliament's oversight role must be pronounced by the manner in which these development targets and indicators are scrutinized and how the executive is required to account for delivery to the people of South Africa. When reflecting on the development targets of the sixth Parliament, it has become evident that there is a need to ensure a targeted oversight focus on the economy so as to ensure that the previously marginalized have access to a better quality of life through their participation in the economy. Research has shown that the confinement of the knowledge economy has momentous consequences for the economy and the society. Today, it has become the single most important cause of both economic stagnation and economic inequality. To overcome this confinement by moving in the direction of inclusive anglicism would be to reignite accelerated growth and to begin redressing the sources of extreme inequality in the segmentation, in the hierarchy of the economy. Structural constraints in the economy continue to create barriers to entry and meaningful economic participation. The current type of struggle hence demands a targeted focus on an advancement of inclusive economic growth by paying special attention to the economic cluster, so as to ensure that the most vulnerable and marginalized are able to 
meaningfully participate in the economy. Our sectoral work and sectoral focus has primarily been underpinned by a focus on the advancement of inclusive economic growth, particularly as articulated in the provisions of the ERRP, which is principally aimed at growing an inclusive economy that is able to address the multifaceted social challenges faced by ordinary South Africans. The sectoral parliaments have carved significant inroads since the beginning of the sixth parliament, effecting a paradigm shift for reporting on sectoral issues across provinces, metros and districts, while strengthening social compacts with stakeholders across various sectors of society. We have also been able to assist parliament I'm sorry, to determine its oversight and policy agenda by highlighting issues of significant importance which have the ability to significantly impact the developmental trajectory of our country. Furthermore, given the fact that sectoral issues are inextricably linked to other interrelated factors of governance and policy issues, it has become evident that sectoral matters cannot be addressed without firstly addressing the prevailing conditions that hamper meaningful change in the lives of the poor and the marginalized. Critical policy and governance matters have emerged as driving factors to enable meaningful material change, which include the need to focus on the state of the economy and its ability to create mass employment. Issues of unemployment, poverty, and the widening gap between the rich and the poor cannot be overlooked, as these conditions are maintained by the current structure of the economy, which make it very difficult for the previously marginalized to participate in the economy. We also cannot ignore issues relating to jobness, joblessness and the precarious nature of work in the informal economy, which mostly affects the poor and the marginalized. In addition to these pertinent issues, matters relating to the capacity of the state to implement key development catalyzing policy priorities, more so given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the living conditions of ordinary South Africans. As we began our public participation trajectory at the beginning of the sixth parliament, we were mindful of these factors and employed every effort to shape not only the landscape of public engagement, but also to define the intervals for sustained report back. So on the Women's Charter of, of, for Accelerated Development, Parliament have successfully completed its nationwide 25-year review of the 1994 Women's Charter for Effective Equality. Through the countrywide review sessions, we were able to gather information and findings which have now become the basis upon which sustained engagement with provinces, metros and districts are continuing, particularly for the advancement of gender equality through strategic oversight mechanisms. The newly adopted 2021 Women's Charter for Accelerated Development which encompasses 15 strategic objectives and sets out the roadmap of broad priority actions appropriately encompasses the invaluable inputs received from all sectors of society concerning gender equality. In seeking to address all the pertinent issues raised during the review process, Parliament has established a social compact with provincial governments across all provinces, including local government, chapter nine institutions and civil society organizations in order to monitor on a quarterly basis the progress made in implementing the provisions of the Charter. This is by far a significant achievement for Parliament as we continue to ensure that the gender transformation agenda remains firmly embedded in government's ongoing development trajectory. From a policy perspective, issues relating gender-based violence and femicide, women's equitable access to land, women's participation in the economy are some of the critical issues anchoring the Charter. Furthermore, a process to engender the provincial growth and development strategies of provinces, as well as the IDPs and LED strategies of municipalities is definitely underway, which will significantly reshape and inculcate a gender perspective in the planning and budgeting process of provinces and local government. Parliament, through its sectoral work, is embarking on a sustained and targeted oversight and accountability campaign in order to oversee the implementation of the, the Women's Charter through a quarterly engagement and report back session as articulated during the Women's Charter review process. Parliament will continue to embark on a process to track progress made in implementing the provision of the Charter to enable measurable progress in the realization of gender equality. Two provinces have already been visited and those provinces are Northwest and Limpopo, of which on the 10th of June, we will be in, in Gauteng, in the Gauteng province. One of the key pillars of the Women's Charter review process was its underpinning law reform pillar, through which we sought to identify key policies and legislation for review 
is guided by the centrality in the process to advance gender equality. The principal intention was to identify gaps in key policies and legislation that are employed for realizing gender equality. In order to advance recommendations for the amendment of such key policies and legislative instruments, we are now implementing the next phase of the law reform process, which is to engage important stakeholders on the amendment of key policies and legislation so as to effectively advance gender equality. To this end, one of the key policy instruments that were highlighted as requiring urgent and extensive review and amendment is a national gender policy framework. Particularly given the evolved policy and developmental landscapes in South Africa, which has further been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. There is also recommendation emanating from the review process to amend the Money Bills Amendment Act in order to address the non-binding nature of gender responsive budgeting, which currently is not mandatory to implement. Amend amendment of this crucial act will also, also ensure that the budget is not passed without segmenting clearly a multi-sectoral development portion, which must be allocated towards the development of women. We have also now formed Men's Parliament, which is an integral part of the gender-based violence and femicide oversight approach, as Parliament continues to build strategic social compacts to ensure an effective response to gender-based violence across communities. Given the, the current state of gender-based violence and femicide in the country, and particularly after the president's announcement of the national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide, the issues related to gender-based violence and femicide have been placed firmly on parliament's agenda across the relevant committees, including the sector parliament's program. We continue to agitate our courts, be constantly, that our courts be constantly reminded that as the final arbiters in matters involving gender-based violence, they have the power to protect women and children and to effectively punish the offenders. In doing so, a clear message should be sent to perpetrators that such conduct will never be condoned, that they have the inherent ability to ensure that courtroom policies and procedures are sensitive to the victim and that the victim who go through the legal system are not subjected to secondary trauma in the form of as humiliating and unnecessary cross-examination. Well, Honorable Chairperson, I want to uh, remind ourselves that on the 19th of April, uh, Parliament through our sectoral Parliament hosted the three sphere, uh, three sphere planning session. The objective of the program was to tighten Parliament's role in monitoring and evaluation, evaluating executive undertakings, and be more effective in tracking the implementation of strategic policies and programs by strengthening three sphere planning, coordination, and oversight through a targeted policy focus for accelerated implementation. That process was meant to assist Parliament to strategically align its overarching, overarching oversight trajectory to clearly delineate policy priorities to the electoral mandate, MTSF, and the NDP. We also, uh, on, on building a capable developmental state, academics have strongly asserted that South Africa has not lacked policies. It has lacked dynamic capabilities inside the public sector to implement those policies. Three interrelated areas have been highlighted by head of the VIT School of Governance, and these include the dynamic capabilities needed to improve implementation of chosen strategic missions and related programs, including digital cap capabilities, innovation in public service, especially with respect to coordinating activities that yield outcomes in a de defined locality, but very much driven by a set of missions and the idea of a developmental state whose aim is to achieve both greater efficiencies and equity outcomes. State capability is a critical enabling factor in adv advancing South Africa's transformation agenda. Parliament has an obligation to ensure that it begins to build the appropriate oversight systems that respond to the inherent institutional factors which hamper the transformation drive in our country. We will continue to focus on these matters. Through our sectoral program, in order to ensure that we systematically and meticulously begin to identify systems, block systemic blockages, to accelerate transformation and move South Africa forward. Parliament's constitutional mandate of, law, of lawmaking has been executed partially successfully. We, we passed and we amended 20 bills or more than 20 bills during this period. Key among the bills which Parliament passed were gender-based violence bills that are aimed at enhancing government's fight against the abuse of women and children, which included the criminal and related matters amendment bill, the criminal law, uh, sexual offenses and related matters, this amendment bill and the domestic violence amendment bill. Parliament's budget, uh, we have been allocated a budget of 2.683 billion for the 2020-22-23 uh, financial year. However, 
expenditure levels seen in the pre-COVID years are not sustainable anymore, and the possible shortfall is forecasted for 2024-2025. The strategic plan and annual performance plan for six parliaments set out its journey of change and transformation. It provides a roadmap to ensure the sustainability, effectiveness, and efficiency of the institution, guaranteeing that parliament continue to represent the people and to ensure government by the people under our constitution. Given the reach and impact of the sector parliament's program, it is imperative that we put mechanisms in place to effectively segment the unique contribution made to the work of parliament through this program. We must ensure that this program is properly funded and effectively resourced in order to ensure that this program continues to bring about the desired impact through the strategic engagement of the three spheres of government. In conclusion, Chairperson, through our sectoral work, we have sought to ensure an agile governance that is adaptive, which acknowledges that policy development is no longer limited to governments, governments, but rather is an increasingly multi-stakeholder effort. Hence, we would like to take this opportunity to thank all our stakeholders. We are continuing to add value to our work from the academics we invite to our lecture series to chapter nine institutions such as the Commission for Gender Equality, Stats SA, uh, FFC, and the Parliamentary Budget Office and many others. We are pioneering new ways of conducting strategic oversight and gaining deeper insights through your strategic analysis, analysis and guidance. So this kind of social compact, we will significantly continue to carve out the path to accelerate the country's transformation again, agenda. Honorable members, as we welcome this budget, we hope and believe it will assist us in emphasizing the imperatives of mainstreaming our gendered perspectives and priorities into government's planning and state machinery arrangement across the three spheres of government so as to improve state capacity to implement gender-sensitive policies and programs. Honorable Chairperson, let me just now express our appreciation to the Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the House Chairpersons, the Chief Whip, all members, as well as the administration, for consistent support to make sure that we can execute our programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Mayor Lucas. I'll now invite the Deputy Speaker of the Eastern Cape Legislature, Honorable Tsoboshian. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, Chairperson of the NCOP, the Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP House Chair and the delegates here. Honorable Minister, Manditatel to Baglenya and Gayama Gohana Makawa Ulucha, or I bump in Zimbi Chisa. In the month of youth. So, Luana Lashumis is Sekos in the Nessay. I the youth who fought for freedom, and I give. Um, is the interpreter? The interpreter. I don't know. Oh, sorry. It. Oh, Ubunzima, Ababe Jongen and Abo, Sasa, commemorating them for the challenge. I would like to say through the struggle that they face. Mabuchin, Kenal Seven Sabbath took up and Obunwiti, Sichong and Nemeko, Zanam Shanji. Let me welcome the budget vote as presented by the chairperson of the NCOP. It is also important to commend the NCOP for adapting during this period under review and continuing to carry out the constitutional mandate uh, with diligence despite the challenges uh, of poise, uh, poised by the COVID-19 and the unfortunate fires that ravaged our parliament earlier this year. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, as we reflect on the achievements and the challenges of the previous financial year, we should remember the as honorable members, our staff that have lost uh, their own uh, lives during the course uh, of this pandemic and uh, during this period. The continued strain on the public purse and the difficulties in the economic environment remain a risk uh, to funding of the parliament and legislature and therefore, the smooth functioning of these organization and fulfillment of their constitutional mandate, the role of parliament and legislatures in building capable, ethical and developmental state remains at risk uh, with the current funding model of parliament and the legislatures. Honorable Chair, we should commend the NCOP for being responsive to the plight of our people and responding to the scourge of gender-based violence and femicide by passing gender-based violence bills amongst many bills passed uh, in the period under review. The committees are primary vehicles for oversight and increasing public participation in the legislative 
and other processes of the NCOP. To this end, former Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Matt Sisulu, states that, and I quote, it is in the legislature that instruments have fashioned to create a better life for all. It is here that oversight of government must be exercised. It is here that our society in all its formations has had an opportunity to influence policy and its imp implementation, close quote. We should therefore always strive to strengthen the committees in order to deepen our understanding and relationship with the executive within the context of oversight for effectiveness of our oversight on the executive. It is also important that the public and various sectors of our communities see the value and impact of our oversight. Honorable members, the NCOP should at all times work closely with the provincial legislatures from planning stages to implementation of public participation programs in particular public hearings. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, allow me therefore to congratulate both houses for achieving clean audit uh, in the period under review. And this is very much encouraging and a good example for the departments that we also oversight. In conclusion, despite the difficulties of economic environment and the challenges posed by the COVID-19, I would like to congratulate the NSOP uh, for successfully implementing its uh, constitution mandate. I also like to implore the legislative sector to expedite the efforts in concluding the funding model for this sector. As Eastern Cape Province, we once again welcome Budget Vote 2 as presented by the chairperson on behalf of the NCOP. Rest well, Your Majesty. Your strides uh, shall forever be emulated by those that are coming after you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker Tobo Shiane. I now invite Honorable Hatebe Pungan. Honorable Chairperson, I suppose I'm audible, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, you are audible. Thank you so much, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, the unprecedented restrictions imposed on our democracy due to the COVID-19 pandemic has had disastrous effects on our communities and their participation in government. The essence of our work in parliament is to be one that is reflective of the people and responsive to their interests. COVID-19 placed tremendous stress on our ability to execute our mandate in terms of oversight, accountability, and transparency of government, of government affairs. But we did not give up. We did our best to continue working under the most exhaustive, albeit necessary, lockdown. This necess necess necessitated a coordinated plan by all of us in Parliament to use digital technologies to continue our work. Many of us who have not come from privileged backgrounds or even a more youthful approach to technology work were thrown in the proverb proverbial deep end of the fourth IR. Then at the beginning of this year, the parliamentary precinct was tragically set aflame. The inferno taking firefighters three days to bring under control and finally extinguish. The extent of the structural damage is still uncertain, but I think it's safe to say that it will be years before the damaged part of the precinct, which houses the NCOP, all all old assembly chamber and national assembly will be operational once again faced with these mammoth challenges it is thanks to the will of, of all of us here today who have found a way to attempt in providing the best possible reach of our mandate special mention must go to the tireless efforts of our chairperson all the parliamentary staff 
parliamentary IT and the table staff who have made it their duty to walk beside us in our duty to the people of South Africa. Without the staff working in the background, in the background so diligently, we would not see such a smooth flow of parliamentary plenaries yet again. The IFP thanks you for your service. Honorable Chairperson, we must bring to the light that parts of parliamentary communication remains out of service, such as telephones. This must be prioritized as it hinders members and parliamentary support staff in the fulfillment of their duties. Honorable Chairperson, this is the People's Parliament. It must be open, accessible, and business as usual as soon as possible. Virtual meetings are not accessible by the large majority of South Africans. Additionally, it becomes difficult for all South Africans to engage and hold government officials to account. Government's lack of attention towards the provision of electricity and affordable, afford, affordable data to South Africans leaves many of the poor's voices mute in terms of development. Chairperson, the IFP caucus would also like to thank Yosef and the speaker for her open door collaborative approach during the recent engagements with opposition party leaders. The strategy and decision-making dis discussions will go a long way in building unity of reaching the goals of the NTP. While service shows that public confidence in parliament is only around 20, 27%, if these engagements can re realize can re re realize fruitful outcomes for the people of the country, then I'm sure that we will see a greater trust in parliament. Honorable Chairperson, in, in, conclu in concluding, I wish to say that the IFP supports the budget vote. I thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Honorable Pumal. Thank you. I will now invite Honorable Nana. Oh, my chocolate. Honorable Nana. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Nyambi, Honorable Members. Our constitution allows for three arms of state, namely the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. Each of these arms is independent from each other and are designed to strengthen our fledgling democracy. We all know the importance of each arm that it plays in ensuring that none of the three overreaches or abuse its authority. Again, honorable members, we all know parliament's primary mandate is to enact laws and exercise oversight over the executive. So in essence, parliament should position itself as a people's house, set on serving the nation and safeguard and safeguarding of the people's civil, liber civil liberties. The House of Parliament should be viewed by the ele electorate as theirs, and so too are their elected representatives. Occasionally in Parliament, I have hosted visitors from the Eastern Cape and elsewhere in the country. It is during these visits that I realized the meaning of parliament to ordinary South Africans. I could see the excitement, the joy, the sense of belonging, the sense of ownership, whilst taking photographs in front of uh, the buildings of parliament, selfies, ne selfies next to the statue of the first democratic president, Mr. Nelson Mandela, and that to be finished off with a scrumptious lunch at either New Wing or Max Building restaurant. I have further, I have further observed that South Africa's love for their parliament. When we were still recovering from New Year's Day Papalaza, we were, we were awoken to unsavory news that the House of Parliament was in flames. There was a real sense of sorrow amongst a vast majority of South Africans. Of course, except opportunists and populists who sought, to, who sought to use such a such a sad moment in the history of our country by calling for the relocation of parliament.
government to Pretoria. Honorable members, scale up the 13 stairs going into the NCOP building. Those stairs are littered with truly amazing words such as freedom and democracy, equality and diversity, unity and reconciliation, openness and participation, oversight and accountability, reconstruction and development, and cooperative governance. And which by all accounts, this is what parliament should be about. But honorable members, it is about time as parliament, we must take a hard look at ourselves, whether we have lived up to the truly amazing words lit out on the stairs in front of the in front of the NC, in front of the NCOP building. I am afraid the answer will not be so encouraging. The House of Parliament, which should be a shield for ordinary South Africans, has not covered itself in glory. During the, during the nine wasted years of state capture by former President Jacob Zuma and, he, and his enablers, by the way, who some of them are still members of this house, parliament slept on the job. Parliament failed to do its work. Parliament sat on its, on its hands. In fact, put it bluntly, those like the DA who called for action by parliament, who called for action by parliament. Instead, the ANC used its majority to shut down those voices. The ANC looked away and closed ranks behind their president. As Honorable Browdesser Elia said, to them, it is party first and South Africans are less important. Honorable members, by extension, Parliament was complicit in the theft of our country's resources. This is confirmed by Judge Zondo's report on, on, on state capture. Months after Judge Zondo released his report directing Parliament to implement remedial actions, presiding officers are once again refusing to act in the, sa in the same manner in which they did during the Zuma years. The citing frivolous, frivolous excuses that they are awaiting for, the pre for President Ramaphosa to table the report before Parliament. Parliament's own legal advisors agreed with the DA that the presiding officers did not have to wait for another arm of state. Parliament's refusal, honorable members, to process the report, the report is, an, is an attempt to protect those members of parliament who are, who are implicated in the Zondo Commission. Thank goodness, with the DA around, you won't get away with it. A charge led by the DA's deputy chief whip, honorable Silvio Wahube, who took the presiding officers head on before they could agree to table, to table the, Zondo, the, the Zondo report to parliament. The legislature as an arm of the state is independent of the other two arms. And therefore, we are no lap dog of the executive. The presiding officers must without delay table this report and all remedial actions are undertaken, are, are undertaken in their totality. Uh, Honorable Mashango, I do not know who, who wrote your speech because I write my speeches, but there, there seem to be contradictions in terms. For some reason, you seem to think that oversight is, is, is exercised to, to, to ensure that the executive implements ANC resolutions. You are wrong, my sister. The, 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 the best definition of oversight, I just hope you were listening to Honorable Lapus La La that is the best definition of oversight. It has got nothing to do with your, your, your party's resolutions. Secondly, <clears throat> Honorable as you, conclude, as you conclude, Honorable Nana. Secondly, Honorable Lucas, I, I agree with you. We must hold the executive to account. But tell me, how do we do it if the chairpersons of portfolio yes, if the chairpersons 
of select committees prevent us from holding those in the executive to account? How do we do it? Therefore, the, the bug still stops with you. Get your house in order as the ANC caucus, and, and we're here to help you do, our, to do your work successfully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Nana. I'll now invite uh, the Chief Nana. Whip of the National Council of Provinces, Dade Mohai. Honorable Mohai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, House Chair, Honorable Nyambe. Allow me to start on a personal note in memory of the 1976 June 16 youth. As we celebrate the 46th anniversary of the 1976 youth uprising this month, it is worth noting that over this past weekend, one of the former members of Mkondo was Sizwe, a generation of the 1976 uprising, and along serving members of the state security agency until 2021, Comrade Roni Khobani was laid to permanent rest after sudden illness. Comrade Roni was one of the most professional and dedicated public servants with unquestionable loyalty to the constitution, the loyal cadre of the ANC till the end. May his soul rest in peace. House Chair, Deputy Chairperson, Honorable uh, Sylvia Lucas, distinguished special delegates, Honorable members, these budget policy debates afford us an opportunity to take the public into confidence about how we have spent the budget allocated to us as this August House. It is an opportunity to take stock of the route we have traversed over the last financial year. What strides we have made in executing the constitutional mandate of this House, and most critically, how all our activities have impacted on the lives of our people. Chairperson, this is critically so when this budget policy debate takes place in the midway of the sixth democratic administration and within the global context of the declining capacity of democracy in its institutions, especially parliament, to push back the escalating crisis of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Contrary to some cynics who believe that the law of Uta turned out is unique to South Africa and attributed to the so-called poor service delivery by the governing African National Congress. The literature on democratic renewal is replete with empirical evidence that political apathy, as evidenced by law voter turnout, is an international phenomenon driven by the disenchantment of the masses with the failure to new liberal democracy and its institutions to address the persistence of deepening levels of poverty unemployment, and inequality. Chairperson, despite this pervasive international crisis, many leading and international research institutions single out South Africa as amongst the leading countries with high voter turnout in the world. Most critically, the budget policy debate also takes place against the domestic backdrop of the qualitative setbacks and reversals of our democratic gains occasions by three critical developments of the recent past. First, the outbreak of the COVID-19 and its continued persistence. Second, the 2021 July unrest in some parts of KwaZulu-Natal and Gauti. And lastly, the recent outbreak of devastating floods in KwaZulu-Natal and some parts of the Eastern Cape. Against this background, the critical question that arises is whether we have risen to the occasion and seize the moment to inspire our people about the better future as the National Council of Provinces. Critical to answering this question is how have our programs set the national agenda that responds to the needs of our people? As the common cause, the agenda of the NCOP is set by the programming committee led by the chair. We sit regularly to consider and sequence range of activities for the House and its committees. At the core of these activities are the consideration of legislation, oversight, and public consideration of issues that affect the provinces. The WIF Forum, which convened by the Chief, we plays a critical role in the political management of the business of the NCOP by facilitating the inputs of provinces and the political parties represented in the NCOP in determining the program of this house. The multi-party WIF Forum serves as a political and strategic clearinghouse of all contentious issues to ensure that 
by the time the program serves before the programming committee, there is a minimum consensus. In his modus operandi, the WIP forum always seeks to arrive at these decisions by consensus, shaped by political debates, mutual compromises, trade-offs and counter-trade-offs. Chairperson, it is worth reaffirming the fundamental principle of democracy that where the consensus is not reached, the voice of the democratic majority must prevail. Chairperson, in pursuance of the strategic mandate of this house as a catalyst for integrated cooperative governance, we have adopted three key high-level flagship programs. One, the NCOP Provincial Week. Two, the NCOP Local Government Focus Week. And three, the NCOP Taking Parliament to the People. These programs are standardized in the annual plan of the NCOP to give effect to the three interrelated strategic goals, respectively, connecting the NCOP permanent delegates with their provincial legislatures in terms of section 100, 113 of the constitution, to give a structured voice of local government in the NCOP in terms of section 67 of the constitution, and facilitate public engagement with three spheres of government under one roof. Chairperson, it is worth noting that the NCOP is the first house of parliament in the whole world to design and implement a robust public engagement model in the form of NCOP taking parliament to the people. To this end, we stand proud that the 2022 Global Parliamentary Report, jointly sponsored by the United Nations Development Program and the Inter-Parliamentary Union, identifies public engagement as critical pillar of democratic renewal and consolidation in the current epoch. Through these programs, we have been able to identify the gaps in terms of the unintended impact of national policy on the provinces and local government, integrate the voices of provinces and local government in the national policy making, and solicit the views and feedback of our people about the impact of national policy on their lives. As part of our integrated response to the disruptions and restrictions imposed by COVID-19 pandemic, we have piloted and adopted a new way of doing business in the NCOP through what is referred to as ministerial plenary briefings. Contrary to some initial cynicism against this initiative, the idea behind the new way of doing business was informed first and foremost by the recognition that COVID-19 pandemic and its impact cuts across all sector departments. And secondly, the capacity of this kind of briefings to bring once the three spheres of government under one roof. Chairperson, as Amika Cabral teaches, and I quote, tell no lies, claim no easy victories, close quote, to paint our past as completely rosy without setbacks and reversals born out of the subjective weaknesses will be tantamount to telling lies and claiming easy victories. Looking back over the last two and a half years, there are many critical lessons worth pointing out if we are to claim the future, critical among these are the synchronization between the program of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. The capacity of the House to follow through its own decisions and the executive commitments. And lastly, the review of our flagship program. Chairperson, the NCOP and National Assembly have distinct constitutional mandates, although complementary. The question for oral reply the questions for oral reply, questions to the president and deputy president, and the budget vote processes all, always occur simultaneously or too close to each other. For inter instance, this robs the NCOP the opportunity to review the impact of the previous budget on the provinces and local government, this defeating strategic agenda on this August House of Forging Integrated Cooperative Governance. More often, the questions for oral reply to president and deputy president in the NA is always followed by the same process within a period at times of a week in the National Council of Provinces. The NCOP has various exciting programs through which it engages with the executive. More often, critical issues are raised that require careful and thorough processing and follow up. But this has not been the case. And in the process, critical issues are lost as a rush to grapple with the new issues ensues. A glaring example is our annual local government focus week, where we go without even a review of decisions, recommendations of the previous focus week. Chairperson, it is my submission that we need to explore intermediate processes 
of engagement to process and follow through our decisions as standard operating procedure. I'm sure honorable members would agree that the conditions have drastically changed since the design and adoption, and adoption of our flagship program. Since the adoption of this program, new realities have emerged and insight gained in terms of how these programs can be enhanced and improved. For instance, among the critical question we must ask is whether the provincial legislatures feel as part and co-owners of the provincial week and taking parliament to the people programs from the planning and actual implementation of these programs or as invited guests. We are raising these questions, Chairperson, because at the end of the day, and more often, governance and service delivery challenges are born out of omissions or commissions by the provincial government which the NCOP has no power to oversee. Without active participation and follow-up by the legislatures on the key issues emanating from this program, our impact as the NCOP is not possible. To conclude, Chair, allow me to express my gratitude as the Chief Whip of the National Council uh, of Provinces, the provincial whips, and the leaders of different political parties for their continued and constructive involvement in the whipari. I must also thank the presiding officers for their guidance and support. I therefore move in support of the vote, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chief Whip Mohai. Thank you. Honorable members, that concludes the debate. I wish to thank the Chairperson, the Demasondo, Deputy Chairperson, May Lucas. Chief Whip Ndademokai, Deputy Speaker of Eastern Cape Legislature, and all delegates for participation in this very important debate. Honorable delegates, I've been informed that there will be one debate on orders two, three, and four. We therefore proceed to second, third, and fourth orders. Policy debate on budget vote 11, public service and administration. Policy debate on budget vote 12, that's public service commission. Policy debate on budget seven, that's national school of government. Honorable members, allow me now to call upon Honorable Nancy, Acting Minister, Public Service and Administration, to open the debate. Honorable Minister Nancy, and then Honorable Deputy Chairperson, May Lucas, would continue with the chairing. May Lucas, whilst Honorable Nancy is taking the platform. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair of the NCOP. The Honorable uh, Chairperson and the Deputy Chairperson of uh, the NCOP and members of the House, the Deputy Minister for the Public Service and Administration, Dr. Chana Pilani Majake, the Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Chairperson and members of the Select Committee, uh, the Chief Whip of the NCOP, the premiers and representatives of the uh, provinces, the Salka representatives, acting chairperson, and commissioners of the Public Service Commission, the chairperson and the board of trustees of the Government Employees Medical Aid uh, Scheme, GEMS, chairperson of the Public Sector Education and Training Authority, the chairperson of the African Peer Review Mechanism National Governing Council, the heads of the institutions within the port uh, portfolio of public service and administration, esteemed guests, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on 4th April 2022, President Ramaphosa appointed me to act as Minister of the Public Service and, and Administration. The Minister of Public Service and Administration is constituted by four entities. The Department of Public Service and Administration, that's vote 11, which is led by the DG, Ms. Yoli Swamakasi. The National School of Government, vote 7, led by the principal professor, 
Busan in Zaweli. The government employees' medical scheme, GEMS, which generates its own income and is not covered in the budget vote, led by the principal officer, Dr. Stan Mulabi, and the Center for Public Service Innovation, which is led by acting director, Ms. Nidia Sibokedi. The Public Service Commission is an independent institution for which I shall also table its budget, the vote 12 established in terms of chapter 10 of the constitution. The PSC is currently chaired in an acting capacity by Professor Somato Dafiki and administratively led by Advocate uh, Dinky Dube. The Deputy Minister, Honorable Pilar Majake, will speak to the role of the Center for Public Service Innovation. Our apex priority for the current administration as a country and department is to build the capable ethical and developmental state. As articulated in the MTSF, a capable state is the one which has the required human capabilities, institutional capacity, service processes, and technological platforms to deliver services to the people. An ethical state is one which is driven by the constitutional values and principles of public administration and the rule of law, focused on progressive realization of economic rights and social justice as outlined in the Bill of Rights. A developmental state is one which aims to meet the people's needs through the interventionist developmental participatory public administration, leading to an active citizenry through partnerships with all sectors of the society. Honorable members, this year marks 25 years since our government adopted the Batupili principles championed by the first post apartheid minister for public service and administration, the late uh, comrade Dr. Zuela Square, who wrote that, I quote, the transformation of our public service is to be judged by the practical difference people see in their everyday lives, unquote. These principles remain relevant today. The DBSA has the task of creating conditions, policies, procedures, and norms and standards that promote a capable ethical and development-oriented public service to strengthen the service delivery. Following from 19, I mean 2019 to 2024 medium-term strategic framework, the department adopted the priority programs. One is the revitalized implementation of Batupil. Two is full implementation of the Public Service Management Act. Three, stabilizing the public service. Four, fighting corruption. And five, effective implementation of the public service policies. In relation to the effective uh, implementation of Batupil, cabinet has approved the Batupil revitalization strategy to promote a people-focused public service. The Public Administration Management Act, that is PAMA, is aimed at harmonizing all three spheres of government to ensure uniformity and synergy, and its implementation will go a long way towards realization of capable state as envisioned by the NDP. Central to the stabilizing efforts will be the effective an efficient, effective and efficient management of the public service finances. The fight against corruption is ongoing. Corruption and other aspects of poor governance and weak institutions have substantial adverse effects on economic growth. The effective implementation of the public uh, policies is about service delivery. Public policy is the translation of public needs into action. We are committed to an integrated approach which fosters partnership of all government institutions across spheres, which fosters the collaboration of institutions um, within the public service and administration portfolio, and through engagement of labor, civil society, and business as we endeavor to improve the service delivery. The work we do as government relies on having a cadre of dedicated, skilled, and hardworking public service who are of public servants who are responsive 
innovative and committed to help release the government objectives. Let me repeat this. We are not apologetic. The work we do as government relies on having a cadre of dedicated, skilled, and hardworking public servants who are responsive, innovative, and committed to help realize government objectives. Ongoing implementation of efforts to improve the performance of the public service, the municipalities, and public entities. This requires the development of an intervention or interventions framework for the government, modernizing of the public administration, strengthening of government monitoring and evaluation and other systems, and systematizing human resource and organizational development and multiple initiatives, all to ensure that the government or the government machinery can contribute to the promise of the better life for all. Strengthening public service delivery is not just about technical exercise. It is about transformation. Pillar one of the white paper of the rights of persons with disabilities refers to removing barriers to access and participation. The framework on the gender responsive planning, budgeting, monitoring, evaluation, and auditing requires institutions to reserve specific budget for the gender matters. South Africa is party to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which seeks to ensure protection of the rights of women at the workplace. The public sector wage bill is under severe pressure due to the general constraints faced by the South African economy. The situation has been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. It is becoming increasingly important to develop a new remuneration framework for the public sector, including wage setting mechanisms to better manage the public sector wage bill and ensure a greater degree of alignment in numeration between the various parts of the public sector. We convened with the unions a timely public service summit on the collective bargaining on the 28th to the 31st March 2022, where all parties engaged in the frank or in a frank exchange but we're able to agree on a number of areas in the final declaration in regard to resourcing reconfiguration and that is allied to JEPS authority, anti-corruption, the fight against poverty, unemployment equality, inequality, and the principle of centralized collective bargaining. Parties to the PSABC, that is the bargaining council, have agreed in principle to align wage negotiations to the government's planning and budgeting site. The National School of Government, which is the NSG, has the mandate to provide or facilitate the provision of education, training, and development interventions in the public sector. The school's five-year strategy is unfolding in a dynamic manner, coinciding with the events like the COVID-19 pandemic and harnessing the potential of the rapidly expanding digital transformation responding to challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality, and constraint budgets. The National School of Government implements the National Digital and Future Skills Strategy, which government adopted in 2020, and recognizes that the digital skills are required for public servants to directly address the service delivery and overcome the logjam caused by limited physical capacity to service a large number of citizens, particularly in remote areas. The NSG achievements include the following, 135,000 e-learner enrollments, rolling out programs in the areas of effective governance, gender and transformation, leadership, induction and policy and regulation, hosting successful leadership development interventions, including the economic governance schools, the program on ethical leadership and uh, excessive oversight and the induction program for the boards of the public entities. The NSG provides training to local government and recently signed a training agreement with the city of Cape Town Metropolitan Municipality and the Gauteng Provincial Government. Today, I'm encouraged that the elected representatives and appointed officials are going back to class. In March 2021, the President Ramaphosa, together with the members of the executive 
and other officials joined the masterclass. I'm encouraged that mayors and state entity board members are being inducted on the ethical leadership and executive oversight. I am encouraged by the thousands of the public servants, including our teachers, who are competing or completing courses in ethics. Honorable members, professionalizing public administration is one of the key imperatives for the state capacity. The president in the State of the Nation address indicated that we are now at an advanced stage of finalizing or finalization of the professionalization framework with an emphasis on pre-entry, recruitment, selection, induction, continuous learning, and career progression of the public servants. Indeed, I wish to assure you that the framework has now been finalized for consideration by the cabinet. It proposes radical public sector reforms, which include more decisive action on consequence management, especially in dealing with mediocrity, mediocrity unethical behavior and corrupt and criminal acts. Instruments to undertake integrity testing before any individual joins the public service. Stabilizing the political administrative interface across the public service with regard to the tenure of the HODs. We shall consider increasing the period of tenure to 10 years subject to, to performance. Repurposing the role of the Public Service Commission for insulating of recruitment and selection practices from partisan influence and manipulation for appointment of teachers and their deputies. Review and strengthen recognition of prior learning for the use in the public sector. The Public Service Commission remains a critical institution committed to establishing sound and good governance in the public service based on the principles of accountability, participation, responsiveness to the needs of the people, transparency and the rule of law in relation to the goal of development orientation, the PSC has found that the South African planning system tends to be geared towards reporting and auditing rather than solution of development problems necessary to combat the poverty, unemployment and inequality. Excuse me. Yes. The PSC's 2021 State of the Public Service Report reveals a lot of variability in capacity and performance across the public service with major deficiencies in departments existing side by side with the pockets of the strengths and excellence. So the report makes proposals on the need to build institutional capacity. The PSC annually conducts announced and unannounced inspections of service delivery sites to evaluate the service delivery from the perspective of citizens and identify challenges that can be addressed immediately. In the last year, included to sites in the provinces of the Northwest and Eastern Cape, as well as 57 uh, home affairs uh, points across uh, the country. The PSC participated in the mission to Waterberg District Municipality in 2021 as part of the partnership between the United Nations and the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs Initiative to support the implementation of the district development model, a critical program in building the state capacity and ensuring improved responsiveness to the community needs. So the PSC Citizens Forum is a distinctly South African method of engaging citizens. It involves the governments working with citizens to propose critical measures to improve service delivery. The PSC continued to monitor the performance of the department in terms of the payment of the invoices of the suppliers within the 30-day framework stipulated in the Public Finance Management Act. Further to this, the PSC continued to intervene in matters of unresponsiveness by the public institution. These interventions include, as an example, requiring SAP's forensic care services to release the forensic report to enable a grieving family to bury their loved one. The issuance of metric certificates, the payments of the SASA COVID-19 relief funds. During the 2021-22 financial year, 
the PSC has continued to contribute towards the improvement of the sound labor relations in the public service through the investigating grievances that could not be resolved between the departments and their employees. So the PSC's final report on effectiveness of the continuous employee development in the public service will assist departments to develop or review their training and development policies in response to the fourth industrial revolution, what is known as four IR skills needs in order to support uh, the government operations and the service delivery. The National Anti-Corruption Hotline assists the members of the public service to report corruption and fraud occurring in the public service. The PSC has witnessed an increase in the level of utilization of this hotline from 872 to 1,563 calls in the 2021-22 financial year, resulting in the recovery of monies fraudulently obtained or punishing the wrongdoers. The PSC conducted an assessment of the effectiveness of the complaints management system in the public service. The study found that there is no consistency in the management of the complaints in the public service and that the monitoring and evaluation of complaints lacks vigor. The PSC has made recommendations aimed at assisting the department in this particular area of work. One of the flagship projects of the PSC is the assessment of the effectiveness of governance support for service delivery, with a particular focus on information and communication technology, as well as physical accommodation of the government to deliver. In supporting parliament to exercise its oversight or its oversight role and hold executive accountable, the PSC will conduct inspections in partnership with parliament. The PSC will contribute towards the professionalization of the public service, continue to conduct investigations into the public administration malpractices and address the underlying causes of ineffective discipline management in the public service. Legislation will be tabled to strengthen the independence of the PSC as a chapter 10 institution. The following budget has been allocated in the respective programs and entities. The DPSA allocation for 2023 financial year is 540 million rand, an increase of 1.6% from the final allocation for 2021-22. The DPSA programs have been allocated the following resources. Program one, which is administration, is allocated 245 million, uh, 200,000 um, rands. Program two, human resources and development is allocated 53 million, 600,000 rands. And program three, negotiations and labor relations and remuneration management is allocated 106,900,000 rands. Program four, the government services and information management is allocated 32,300,000 rands. Program five, services access and improvement, which also includes the transfer payment to the Center for Public Service Innovation is allocated 102,300,000 a thousand. The budget of the NSG for this financial year is 228 million. As the NSG has to generate additional revenue for its financial sustainability, the training the trading entity has budgeted to raise income from the cost fees of 101 million. The PSC budget or budget allocation for 22-23 financial year is 280 million rand. In summary, our task is to change the lives of South Africans for the better through an ethical, capable, and developmental public service. Let me finally thank the Deputy Minister, the DG, and the officials of the DBSA and the entities for their commitment and the hard work for also inducting me as the acting minister. I hereby table the budget of the DBSA, its entities, and the PSC for 2022-23 financial year. Thank you very much, House Chair.
Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, Minister Nlesi. We continue with the debate and we now call on the Honorable Kenny Musi Manehape Moimang to continue with the debate as the chairperson of the Select Committee. Uh, thank you, the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Province, uh, Mr. Lua Lucas. Uh, Allow me to also extend a word of greetings to, to the National Chair in and uh, the, the two house chairs, uh, the Chief Whip of the National Council of Province, and also the, the Minister, uh, uh, together with the Deputy, and also uh, greetings to the permanent delegates and special delegates. Uh, indeed, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair, uh, allow me on behalf of the African National Congress to, to uh, voice uh, my support uh, to the, the uh, three votes as tabled by the Honorable Minister, uh, particularly with regard to locating the role of this three institutions within our broader developmental agenda, uh, precisely by the issue of the fact that as we celebrate uh, June month, uh, we need to remind ourselves that those talent uh, young people, uh, when they rose against the system, they were conscious of the fact that uh, uh, they expect us the current generation of leaders to confront the leaders of colonialism of a special type, and that colonialism and apartheid created a particular relations of capitalism, which created a landless majority, a propertyless and unskilled labor, labor in class. And we therefore we agree with the minister that we need a state that is unapologetic to the captain of industry, but be bold uh, to lead a long concerted effort, uh, drive for the economic growth, and ensure that uh, the resources are mobilized for developmental purposes, like the East Asian economies did in the past. Honorable House Chair, the National Development Plan commit us to this vision of building an ethical, capable, and a developmental state. And that this state was defined as having the capacity to mobilize the private sector, the working class, and all sections of society towards a developmental agenda aimed at resolving the triple challenges of poverty and unemployment and inequalities. Therefore, the developmental state that we referred to is rooted in the realities of a mixed economy where in the state has to be interventionist in its nature for a strong and vibrant uh, public and private sector and also protect the poor and the working class for the excess, from the excesses of the market. For the state, Honorable Deputy Chair, to be able to undertake this most task, it identified in the National Development Plan that there is a need to build capabilities and inculcate progressive values in the public service, which mirror those envisaged in the Constitution. And indeed, the Constitution of our country outlines, in terms of Section 1591, that the public service must be governed by democratic values and principles enshrined in the Constitution, among others, a high standard of professional ethics must be promoted and maintained, and also that public service must be developmental or must be developmental orientated, and has have a good human resource management and a career development practices to maximize human potential, which has to be cultivated. Honorable Deputy Chair. We remain committed to the implementation of the steps that were identified in the National Development Plan to promote the values 
and principles of public administration as enshrined in the Constitution. Therefore, the ANC, the National Development Plan highlights that in order to address the challenges of poverty and inequality, there is a need for a well-run and effectively coordinated state institutions with skilled public servants who are committed to the public good and capable of delivering consistently high quality services while prioritizing the nation's developmental objectives. Furthermore, as the ANC, we believe that in building human capital, we need to ensure that this is done through the development of retention of qualified and capable public service, which is quite important for the developmental state because it allows it to pursue its developmental objectives that are referred to in order to foster sustainable and more inclusive growth. The capable public service also has the ability to be innovative and resolve modern day challenges in a manner that saves time, energy, and resources. Honorable Deputy Chair, this means that we can foster a culture of specialization and focus on maximizing areas where the public service has a competitive edge. And with a capable public service, the limited resources of government will be channeled towards better service delivery and the pursuit of the developmental objectives. Honorable Deputy Chair and Honorable Members, unevenness in capacity tends to lead to uneven performance in the public service. And this unevenness is caused by a complex of set of factors, including tensions in the interface between political and administrative uh, institutions, instability also at administrative level, a skills deficit, insufficient attention, the erosion of accountability and authority in poor organizational design and also low staff morale. So therefore, we appreciate that steps are being taken by the democratic state led by the ANC to strengthen skills, enhance morale, clarify lines of accountability, and build, building an if ethical public service. These steps, Honorable Deputy Chair, are guided by the need for a long-term policy stability, as well as awareness of potential adverse effects of over-regulation. Honorable Deputy Chair, the democratic state led by the ANC has already promulgated legislation which laid the basis for what we seek to achieve in the public service. First, we must ensure that public servants are not pursuing narrow business interests at the expense of the public. However, we take, we take comfort in the fact that in 2016, the public service regulations in which regulation 13C, 13C uh, is captured, it's a prohibition to public service employees from doing business with the state or any of its organs. Furthermore, Honorable Deputy Chair, the Section 8 of the Public Administration Act of 2014 criminalizes the conducting of business with the state for public administration and for advisors. We continue to monitor the implementation of these provisions in order to ensure that we root out rent-seeking elements in the public service. For example, in ESCOM, uh, it was discovered that there are 3,812 employees who are doing business with the entity, and we have to begin a process of ensuring that there is consequence management applied. Furthermore, Deputy Chair, Section 18 of the Public Finance Management Act provides for the disclosure of financial interest and setting up the ethics, integrity, and discipline technical assistance unit, as well as the Office of Standards and Compliance Regulations. This is also one of the reasons why, as the ANC, we are supporting this budget, because this has been implemented through the introduction of the new and improved Z83, from which requires those interested in the public service satisfy these requirements. Our role is to ensure that there is full compliance around these provisions and where there is no transparency, proper consequence management must be meted out. Honorable Deputy Chair, there is also a need for the implementation of electronic systems for self-diagnostic and compliance audits through the measurement instruments of the Office of Standards and Compliance. The organizational functional assessment tool is being consolidated 
to measure institutional governance as well as organizational administration. Honorable Deputy Chair, globally, the trends in public service is gravitating towards the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and this has an effect in terms of how the old and outdated methods of public service uh, will be uh, effective. So therefore the department will be leading digital transformation and digitization transformation of the public service. Some of the key interventions in this regard will include developing required scripts to enable and support the digital transformation of the public administration. This will ensure that government is a key economic enabler and player that positively benefits from the digitalization and the digitization. The improvement in service delivery requires that we deepen the professionalization of the public service framework as raised by the uh, minister in his debate. Indeed, Honorable Deputy Chair, this requires us to return to the Batupil principles and the public service charter and strict monitoring thereof. In addressing the gaps and the weakness, the department will over the MTF period institutionalize a number of integrated interventions, which include, among others, the strengthening of the implementation of the operations management framework and service delivery improvement plan, as well as revised program to strengthen the implementation of the Batupil program. Hence, the agency support this budget. The Honorable Deputy Chair, professionalizing the public service requires an unpartisan approach because, as the ANC, we believe that it is in the interest of the National Democratic Revolution for the public service to be nonpartisan. For this to be realized, the public service must be depoliticized and government department must be insulated from the politics or political parties' micromanagement because the bureaucracy must continue to loyally and diligently implement the political mandate set by the voters and the party, but to refrain from being political actors themselves. Honorable Deputy Chair, this requires us to include a culture of meritocracy in the public service that encourages the development and retention of the most capable and skilled public servants. This has been a serious challenge because the most capable minds are lost to the private sector. And in order to address this, we must make a public sector to be a more attractive career of choice with proper reward system. This is much more critical at the local government level. Honorable Deputy Chair, one of the driving factors for the degeneration at local government is the lack of human resource. This was highlighted in the Auditor General's Municipal Finance Management uh, Act uh, report. 2018-2019 audit report, which was titled, Not Enough to Go Around, Yet Not the Right Hands at the Tail. This report basically highlighted the finance departments in municipalities are staffed, staffed to capacity, and yet there is an over-reliance on consultants to do the work. This is because of tendencies such as nepotism in the recruitment processes. Honorable Deputy Chair, we need to synchronize the interventions which have been made with regards to the professionalization of the public service or the work being done at local government level. Honorable Deputy Chair, the intentions of a development state are to provide direct direction to capital and all other sections of society by driving investment into productive sectors of the economy. These are sectors that are labor intensive and ensure that we employ our people. Hence my opening statement, Honorable Deputy Chair. The start with the investment in the public service in the financial state must first invest in the development of skills and expertise in the public service, which will be innovative and creative in the prosecution of the public mandate and service delivery. This will be attractive to private investment. Honorable Deputy Chair, we must also reflect on this question within the broader context of the economic recovery and construction plan that was announced by the President as a response to negative impact of COVID-19 global pandemic. Indeed, the development of state with technical and political capacity to lead development and transform the economy is identified as one of the pillars required to drive economic reconstruction and recovery. Honorable Deputy Chair, in conclusion, the plan also reflected on the reconstruction and transformation of the economy. Thus, it is explained and entailed as inclusive of a building 
a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive economy. The plan identifies priorities such as interventions to be made, and this includes employment of orientated strategic localization and export promotion, and gender equality and economic inclusion of women and the public service must be at the forefront of this intervention, and it must suggest innovative ways in which this must be carried out at all levels of the state. One of these interventions should be the implementation of the gender-based violence and femicide national strategic plan, which proposes, amongst others, streamlining and budgeting on budgeting for gender interventions. ANC leads, ANC leads, we support the budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Moima. We continue and we now call on the Honorable Timothy Bratese to continue with the debate. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, Honorable Minister, Honorable Members, fellow South Africans. Let me start by saying that I have deep empathy for the Minister. He has been given the unenviable task of supervising two massive departments, Employment and Labour, and the Ministry under scrutiny today, the Public Service and Administration. On reflection, however, it would appear that Honourable Ramaphosa has seen employment and the public service as essentially the same thing. After all, it is a perfect way to ensure continued patronage amongst the workers of South Africa towards the governing party. In simple terms, the Minister has oversight of the Department of ANC Voter Affairs, a thinly disguised new seat at the Cabinet table. But this department is not only designed to ensure patronage through mechanisms like the minimum wage, it is also perfectly positioned to ensure the furtherance of corrupt activities. It is common cause that, that to bite the hand that feeds you would be career suicide. So why would you risk the future of yourself and your family by biting back at the political hand that is pointed out the corrupt favor required? I would like to remind the minister of the formula for corruption in academia. Corruption, equals power plus discretion minus ethics, or perhaps more appropriately in the South African context, power plus discretion minus ethics equals corruption. In an ethics-free environment, Minister, you have a corruption in its purest form. From 1994 onwards, a slow poison has quietly been seeping into the system, a cancer that would take a young nation with the world at its feet to literally being on its knees in front of the world. Franz Fanon reflected in his Wretched of the Earth how inevitably every post-colonial country will always replace the previous bourgeoisie with a new one. He predicted that the new class, like those before it, would exploit their new power to extract benefit for themselves without actually creating anything. In its pressing need to bolster their vote under the disguise of transformation, the ANC began its program of cater deployment. This policy, first formulated in 1985, placed a huge emphasis on loyalty to the party and not the state. The policy of cadre deployment, confirmed by the president of the Zondo Commission, meant that suitably qualified individuals were overlooked as a result of the policy. Legions of South Africans were placed in government because of their credentials and sacrifice in the struggle. But many, many more were deployed merely out of a pledge to the ideals of the National Democratic Revolution as espoused by the ANC. And so, the slow poison referred to earlier took hold. Departments became, slowly became dysfunctional, not overnight, but in a slow process that has taken almost three decades, decades to manifest itself fully. The next ruinous effect to take hold was when the ugly head of greed arose. Businessmen and women became alive to the fact that with a little prompting, these deployed cadres could be swayed to serve their interests. After all, these cadres had power, discretion, and with a bit of encouragement, could be persuaded to compromise their ethics. In an admirable effort to ward off these effects, the government promulgated a raft of anti-corruption legislation, with the PFMA being the flagship. But the inherent weakness in such a well-regulated environment lies in enforcement. The simple fact is that, the, that South Africa is policy rich, but implementation poor. Any critique, any challenge to the state of affairs would be vigorously rejected as counter-revolutionary and fought off at all costs. 
Franz Fernand reflected on cognitive dissonance of the time. People sometimes hold a core belief that is very strong. When they are presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence simply cannot be accepted. Let me be clear, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, the dissonance, the, the dissonance referred to by Fanon knew no demographics or political persuasion. It is a human condition. It is often said that the true definition of intelligence is not IQ tests. It is the ability to adapt to change. There is nothing wrong with acknowledging the mistakes of the past and taking a new path. Minister, it is not a sign of weakness. It is indeed a sign of courage. In this environment, that South, Africa, South Africans were given hope when legislation like the Public Administration Management Act, or PALMA, was promulgated in 2014. This act gave rise to the public service regulations of 2016. Another feature of this regulation, of this legislation, was to establish the Public Administration, Ethics, Integrity, and Disciplinary Technical Assistance Unit. Quite a mouthful. This unit was formally established in April 2020. There is, a, there is still, however, confusion about its role and any work accomplished to date. At our last engagement in this committee, where the minister was present, I requested an update on its work. A report was promised on 11 May. Almost a month later, I am still waiting. Again, policy rich, implementation poor. The annual performance plan refers to Palmer being implemented by 2025. Talk about kicking the can down the road to the next Minister of ANC Voting Affairs. It also speaks to an intensified anti-corruption activities, but again, no action to date. The budget totals, this budget totals some 450 billion, which is a third of the nation's fiscus. A budget fit to ensure a massive amount of patronage and ensure loyalty to the National Democratic Revolution and the mothership. However, if only it were true. The reality, Minister, and members of, of the NCOP, is that the sands of our country are shifting under the feet of the governing party. In academic circles, the whispers are growing to a crescendo. Cadre deployments and triple B, double E are being rejected and seen for what they are, cynical me mechanisms for self-enrichment. The people of our country are starting to express themselves not only in the dusty streets, but also at the ballot box. The electoral verses for the ANC are coming quick and fast, starting with the carnage on November 2021 to the most recent landslide, landslide win for the Democratic Alliance in Kariaburg in the Northern Cape. Voters are slowly starting to realize that the DA, obsessive about appointing the public service on merit and not allegiance, govern better to the benefit of all citizens where they hold power. Where the DA governs, we govern well. Our officials are committed, they work with the true values of Batu Pele, and they take ownership of their work. Where our politicians and officials make a misstep, they take it on the chin, and they step aside without threats and legal action. The question that remains is whether the minister will remain in traps, remain trapped in Fanon's cognitive dissonance, or whether he will break the chains and act to reform the public service in a meaningful and effective manner. What will you do, Honourable Minister? The time for change is now. I oh, thank you. Thank you, Honourable Brotese. We continue and we call on the Honourable Maruna Liliev Mamarekhane to continue with the debate. Uh, thanks, thanks, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister, Honorable Chief Whip, Honorable Members. Public servants are the backbone of public service administration. They are the implementation drivers in the government, and it therefore becomes crucial that the public service possesses skilled and experienced public servants. Our transformation agenda as the ANC entails building a capable de developmental state that serves the interests of the South Africans. Our approach has always been people centered. We are building a developmental state that provides effective basic services and with cap capabilities to take forward a far reaching agenda of national economic de development. While at the same time, placing people and their 
involvement at the center. Building a developmental state requires skilled, capacitated, and experienced human resources to put forward our trans transformation agenda. Public servants are fundamental to ensure proper imp implementation of government policies. Honorable Deputy Chairperson and honorable members, when we speak about capable, we imply a state capable to formulate policies that respond to the rep repeat challenges of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, and implement such policies to, to mitigate these challenges and developmental in that those policies focus on overcoming the root causes of poverty and inequality. However, we recognize that building state capacity is the most crucial step of all in the NDP. We recognize that an even collaboration and consolidation in capacity in all three spheres, spheres of government to be an to be a weakness caused by complex set of factors, including a skill deficit in public service. We know that deficit in skills and professional professionalism, professionalism affects all elements of public service from a senior, middle, and junior levels. We acknowledge that previously there was insufficient focus of providing on providing stimulating career paths that ensure that production of skills and foster a sense of professionalism. As an agency, if we are to ensure the building of capable and developmental state at all three spheres of government, we must also emphasize strengthening and professionalization public administration, particularly top management and the delivery sectors. Building the educational feeder system to pro produce de developmental skills, technical and professional personnel. Noting all the characteristics and requirements of building a capable development developmental state, we must recognize the significance of the National School of Government to be the main driver of driving capacity capacitation in the public service. When we speak about capacity, honorable members, we are making reference to human resources and the required skills necessary in driving our transformation agenda. The public service is tasked with building a meritocratic and professional public service. However, the National School of Government is responsible for the development of, development of technical and special professional skills and appropriate career path for the technical uh, specialists. The National School of Government also a crucial role, plays a crucial role in capacitation of public servants in all spheres of government to ensure that we attain the goals of the national democratic revolution. The National School of Government provides for talent management across all spheres and therefore should continue to provide guidance for the appointments, succession, planning, and career development. The National School of Government must continue to ensure that it provides training and development opportunities to public servants and elect public represent representatives to fulfill their responsibilities. The National School of Government is the main driver of prof professionalism Realization framework of the public service. We are pleased to, to know that the process of public consultation has taken place and will will be awaiting the finalization of the framework. We commend the NSG for, for the consultation of various groups, such as civil society organizations, institution of higher learning, regulators, policy department, departments, oversight uh, institution and quality council, to name a few. As the ANC, we welcome the training program offered by the NSG at the local level, the local government leadership program. We continue the fact that the NSG is responsible for capacitation, 
capacitation in all levels of government and encourage public servants at the local spheres of enroll in the course of to further strengthening their skills and capacities. I mean, capabilities. This is in response to the challenges that has been raised at the local government level. Therefore, commend the energy for heading to the call. The National School of Government has made impressive strides to ensure for quality education and training for its students through the signing of agreements with higher education institutions to expand learning opportunities for public servants. This institution includes Forte University, Nelson Mandela University, University of Pretoria, University of Technology, University of Johannesburg, Rhodes Business School, Northwest University, Devon University of Technology, Stellenbosch University. Key deliverance of the partnership involves the develop development and review of curriculum in various areas related to public sector performance and development, quality assurance and joint certification of programs, core development and delivery of NSG programs using the HEI's human resources provide provide ex expert input in various education and training areas of relevant fields and subject uh, matters, undertake research projects, projects with NSG as well as the provision of coaching and mentoring services to various levels of public sector officials. The partnership with the higher learning institutions enables the NSG to Provide, provide the programs throughout the country, which expands the scope of professional development for public sector employees and leaders. In selected cases, the program will help participate partic participants with the recognition of prior learners, learning, learning with while also opening opportunity for further study in, study in relevant fields. Public servants, members of the executive, employees, members of legislature, councillors, and employees of all organs of state will be eligible for, for enroll for programs delivered through this partnership in, in, a, in a cost recovery basis. This is not public buzzer scheme. Building as a, a, yes, this is not a public uh, buzzer scheme. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, we are pleased to know that provincial government and local government, such as the city of Cape Town, are also beneficiaries of the programs aid <coughs> was provided by National School of Government. Earlier this year in February, the National School of Government and the city of Cape, Cape Town Metropolitan Municipality entered into a metro. Memorandum of Agreement for the NSG to provide training programs to the employees of the City of Cape Town, Metropolitan Municipality on financial management and supply chain management amongst other key education, training and development interventions. The NSG will provide training on areas including contract management, bid committees, ethics in local government, and municipal man supply manage, uh, chain management. As an agency, we are pleased to know that the DA government also utilizes the services offered by the National School of Government, although they reject the, its report when tabled. Honorable members, we have to give credit where it, it is due. The NSG has made visible studies in ensuring professional cap cap capacitation of public uh, servants were required. Recently, the NSG has launched partnership with the World Economic Forum in February. The partnership will all enable public servants to access information from WEF strategic intelligence, intelligence, intelligence platform. The objective of the landmark partnership is to support public sector initiatives through access to a wide array, array, array of, of research insight. As the 
as sorry, as the ANC, we recognize the the comment, the work that is done by the National School of Government. However, it will like for the school to fast track the finalization of the profession professionalization framework for the further implementation of for a more professional public service. Though the ANC, the NSG as the ANC, we are ad adamant in building a and creating a skilled public service KDAP that serves and delivers on government man's, ma government's mandate diligently. We urge the National School of Government to work in collaboration with the Center for Public Service. To work with the, uh, with the Center for Public Service Innovation to drive innovation in the public service and particularly in the field of uh, digitization to provide learners with more avenues of platform when it comes to learning. We support the budget vote. I thank you, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Ma Marekhane. We are continuing and we call on MEC Brown of the Free State to continue with the debate. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson of the NCLP, Honorable Lucas. Allow me to recognize the Chairperson of the NCLP, Honorable Masondo, Minister Ndesi, uh, Deputy Minister, um, Honorable Bilani Majaki, House Chairperson, Honorable Nyambi, Chief Whip of the NCLP, Honorable Mohai, Chairpersons of other committees present, members of parliament and provincial legislatures, MECs, and the community on the virtual parliamentary platform. Good afternoon. Honorable Chairperson, thank you for the opportunity to reply to the debate on the budget vote speeches, which was well delivered by the Department of Public Service and Administration, Nas National School of Government and Public Service Commission. The African National Congress drafted this year's manifesto with a priority on policy directives to build a capable developmental state with an effective and ethical public service that drives the implementation of South Africans transformation agenda. It is upon this premise, Honorable Chairperson, that we will continue to have the above departments as a center of governance and as a priority framework in the cabinet by the ruling party. We enter the month of June and we celebrate this youth month. We are reminded that we will continue to employ young people into the public sector, not only on learnerships and graduate programs, but also on permanent positions within various departments across all three spheres of government. And that is why we will support the entry level uh, positions review on the entry level requirements. Honorable members and members of the National Council of Provinces, this year marks 25 years since our government adopted the Batopele principles, championed by the first post apartheid minister for public service administration, the late Dr. Zola um, Squeya. As the acting minister in Lacey already quoted, and I wish to repeat this quote because it is very relevant, in his forward to the Batapele white paper, Dr. Squeya pointed out that the transformation of our public service is to be judged rightly by the practical difference people see in their daily lives. And these principles, absolutely, they do remain relevant today. In his speech, the acting minister also outlines that the apex priority for the current administration as a country and as the department is to build such a capable, ethical and developmental state. And, are, and as articulated in the medium term, strategic framework. A capable state is one that has the required human capabilities, institutional capacity, service processes, and technological platforms to deliver services to the people. The minister also outlines that an ethical state is one that is driven by the constitutional values and principles of the public administration and the rule of law focused on the progressive realization of socioeconomic rights and social justice as outlined in the Bill of Rights. And lastly, you also outline that a developmental state is one that aims to meet people's needs through interventionist, developmental, participatory, public administration, leading an active citizenry through partnerships with all sectors of society. 
Honourable Speaker, Honourable uh, Deputy Chair, ongoing implementation of efforts to improve the performance of public service, municipalities and public entities requires the developmental uh, development, uh, development of interventions framework for government, modernizing of public administration, strengthening of government monitoring and evaluation, and other systems, systemizing human resource and organizational development within these Batapela initiatives, and of course, implementation. So we have to build government machinery that can contribute to the promise of a better life of all within the Republic of South Africa. Deputy Chair, we may have a short discussion uh, through about our national fiscus as we're going to deal with the finances of this budget. Our national fiscus has been challenged given the global economic challenges, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the various constrained budget over a period of five years or more. Our expenditure is greater than revenue by 15% as national government as or as the national fiscus, which has led to the increase in debt to GDP to 69.9%. The DPS the DPSA's work thus far on the national wage bill, as well as norms and standards within the public service, the creation of standardization of organizational diagrams and other optimization programs across all spheres of the public sector were mechanisms and is mechanisms to address our increasing expenditure as a government. The benchmarking on cost of, employ of employment or cost of employees have been further mechanisms to support uh, the draft financial efficiencies towards the creation of lean and mean structures within the public service. I believe that the DPSA's role on attrition rates within the public service has also been formed to, part, to be part of this enhancement exercises to bridge the gap on our expenditure. So as we all within provinces are looking at cost containment exercises and measures, treasury notes to deal with such um, challenges that we are experiencing, you can see that the national department is leading when it comes to policy setting on being able to create structures within government that would be able to help a sustainable fiscus. Honorable Deputy Chair on National School of Government, I would like to um, outline that it has a mandate to provide and facilitate the provision of education, training, development interventions as they do within the public sector. We should also be aware that the school's five-year strategy is unfolding in a dynamic manner, coinciding with the events like COVID-19 and harnessing the potential of a rapidly expanding digital transformation, responding to the challenges of poverty, unemployment and in inequality, the constrained budgets, and also responding to the changes in our global economy. Deputy Speaker, the President in his State of the Nation address indicated that we are now at an advanced stage of the finalization of professionalization framework, which other members had already outlined. And if I can just touch on some of, of those matters in terms of the framework, we are so excited about the proposed radical public sector reforms, which will include a more decisive action on consequence management, especially dealing with mediocrity, unethical behavior, corruption, and criminal acts committed. Instruments to undertake integrity testing before any individual joins the public sector, stabilizing the political administrative interface across the public sector with regard to the tenure of HODs as well as uh, those of SMS members, repurposing the role of public service commission to the installation of recruitment selection practices from partisan influence, as well as the review and strengthening of recognition of prior learning within the public sector. On the Public Service Commission, Honorable Deputy Chair, it remains a critical entity of the department committed to establishing sound and good governance within the public service based on principles of accountability, participation, and responsiveness to the needs of our people, transparency, and of course, the rule of law. Honourable Members, the PSC's 2021 State of the Public Service Report reveals a lot of variability in capacity performance across all spheres of government with major deficiencies.
deficiencies in departments existing side by side with pockets of strength of excellence. I'd like to touch on the Free State Province, Honorable Deputy Chair. We are proud to realize that the PSC continues to monitor the performance of departments in terms of payment of invoice of supplies within 30 day timeframes as stipulated by the fi Public Finance Management Act. The PSC also monitors the financial disclosures of senior ma management officials within all departments on provincial government and has successfully received 100% of financial disclosures from all departments in the Free State this year. Further to this, the PSC in its quest to be responsive to the need of our citizens and ensure the accountability continue to intervene in these matters of the so-called unresponsiveness by public institutions, we then do allow and support the PSC with those specific required services and, and the various support. These interventions include, for example, the SAPS forensic service release of a forensic analysis report to enable a grieving family to bury their loved one, and the issuance of matric certificate, as well as the pay, payments of SASA COVID-19 relief funds. Congratulations to the PSC for that work that they've done. In closing, Honourable Deputy Speaker, the PSC's final report on the effectiveness of continuous employee development in the public service will assist departments to develop and or to review their training and development policies in response to the fourth industrial revolution skills needed in order to support government operations and service delivery and to remain relevant within the technological changes with within governments across the globe. All of the above can be achieved with a chaired vision, Honorable Deputy Speaker, and part of that chaired vision is completing a skills audit and a lifestyle audit across all spheres of government, training on the management of political and administrative interface, which has also been conducted in our province and other various provinces. These are beautiful mechanisms to proactively address some of those listed challenges that we heard before and that we are facing Good, honourable member. Thank you very much, honourable uh, deputy um, speaker. As the province, we support this budget. Kialiboa. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, honourable Khadija. Thank you. Brown. We are now calling on the deputy minister of public service and administration, our former programming whip, honourable Chana Pilani Mijake. I think you are muted. I think you are muted. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Honorable uh, Chairperson of the NCOP, Tate Amos Masondo, um, the Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, uh, Ms. Sylvia Lucas, members of uh, the NCOP, the Chairperson of the Select Committee, and Tate um, uh, Muiman, Minister of Public Service and uh, Acting Minister of Public Service and Administration, Honorable Nessi, uh, the Premiers and members of the Provincial Executive Council uh, present here with us today. Um, Honorable House Chairperson, in considering uh, this, uh, the strategy and, and, and annual performance plans of the entities of the Department of Public Service and Administration, uh, the committee emphasized that plans and budgets allocations must serve the needs and aspirations of citizens. This was expressed with the understanding that budget allocation or sufficient budget allocation serves as a key instrument for government to promote growth and development in South Africa. Budget allocation plays a critical role as an economic instrument of government across provinces to reflect the country's socioeconomic policy and priorities. The budget serves as a vital tool to operationalize government programs towards the achievement of intended priorities. Without the budget, the annual performance plans remains a pipe dream. The Department of Public Service and Administration is mandated by section 1951 of the constitution, which sets out basic values and principles that the public service should adhere to and the Public Service Act as amended. 
The Public Service Act of 1994 takes care of dissolution of powers and control to provinces emboldening responsibilities of the Minister for Public Service and Administration, which are amongst others, the health and wellness of employees, electronic government and information management in public service, integrity, ethics and anti-corruption, transformation, reform, innovation, and any other matter to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of public service. The programs of the Department of Public Service and Administration talks to public, service, public administration policy, formulation and implementation, regulation and improvement of public service conditions of employment, technological connectivity and digitization of government, ensuring service delivery improvement through Batupili principles and ethical norms and standards. Connectivity and digita di digitization of government remains a huge challenge that will be resolved by finalizing of treasury engineered technical integrated financial management system. House chairperson, I just want to address the paranoia that sometimes some of the opposition members of the opposition have when they actually uh, make it, uh, the presentation in the House. Uh, Honorable Brautesis of the DA has actually uh, continuously, and I think it's not only him, whenever the DA actually uh, gets a platform, they talk about CADA deployment in uh, government. And that CADA deployment actually creates an impression that the African National Congress only uh, appoints um, people who are associated with the African National Congress in government. This is not the case. When South Africans actually look for, for, for jobs, uh, there is public service regulations that guide us, that actually allows them to come into the public service because we want all South Africans to have public service as a career of choice. And nobody is ever actually asked to present a membership card of the African National Congress when they actually enter into government. And the a, a, a political party like the, the Democratic Alliance knows it better. Otherwise, we would have had a lot on lot of cases at the door of the courts with, uh, challenging. With, with your respect, Deputy Minister, because you, it's know not, where, you know order, where you are not order, saying is not true. Order, you are lying order, through your order, teeth, Deputy order. Minister. Continue to debate, Deputy Minister, Honorable Nana, please Thank order. You, Honorable Chairperson, he had this opportunity to speak now. He should actually allow me uh, to speak and to clarify what I continue to refer to as a paranoia that exists. It confuses South Africans because this is a platform to engage South Africans and to help them to understand how government actually is intending providing services. And today, therefore, we are looking at the budget, how much of money is there. And this is what all other political parties parties are supposed to actually assist us to do instead of really creating stories as if this is a platform for campaigning. Uh, Honorable House Chairperson, this ANC-led government through the Department of Public Service and Administration has intensified yeah, the fight against now. corruption by strengthening anti-corruption practices in public service in terms of setting of norms and standards for public service of South Africa, appointment of the ethics officers by all government departments to monitor and respond to corrupt practices, lifestyle audits for public servants comparing employee salaries to assets they own, um, uh, they own a launch of ethical disciplinary and integrity technical task team that works jointly with civil society in building anti-corruption strategy in public service, protection of whistleblowers. And in this regard, I wish to actually appreciate the legislative amendments um, that have actually been put in place by the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development in strengthening uh, legislation that protects whistleblowers. Um, and this has been done in the form of the um, um, amendment of the Protected Disclosures Act. Uh, there's also a fusion center that brings together all security agencies to intensify the fight against corruption. Anti-corruption hotline that is operated by the uh, uh, Public Service Commission is but one of the other measures that we have actually managed as government to put in place in order for us to actually demonstrate and be in the position to manage to deal with corruption. There's also annual declaration of interest by public servants to ensure that they are not conflicted and doing business with government. There's also improved uh, consequence management practices, such as ensuring that public servants who transgress the law and are sanctioned do not manage to get their way back into public service. Honorable House Chairperson, um, the Center for Public 
service innovation is established in terms of section seven um, A listed in schedule three A of public service act of 1994 is amended. The mandate of the Center for Public Service Innovation is to strengthen solution-oriented culture and practice of innovation in the public sector to improve public service delivery. Through its mandate, the, the Center for Public Service Innovation contributes towards the building of capable, ethical, and developmental state through innovation and all innovative solutions. Some of the notable solutions of uh, the Center for Public Service uh, innovation are but not limited to agri-tech solutions, COVID-19 induced e-learning solutions, water filtering systems uh, that actually helps to improve on the quality of water, fire prevention devices for informal settlements that we know are forever actually experiencing fire hazards, personal safety and crime prevention solutions such as MEMESA, which is um, an instrument that is actually utilized by um, ordinary people, especially in informal settlements, to actually manage to bring attention to themselves, um, in for, um, managing to alert uh, their neighbors when something that is wrong is happening to them. There's also online to some center, the hackathons, which are just forums that are actually utilized to bring together young people who are uh, technologically astute to come together and they're given a problem and they actually come up with solutions for public service. A lot has been done in this regard. CPSI and F innovation towards improved public service. CPI, uh, CPSI nurtures innovation in public service, thus the annual awards for innovators. CPSI continues to grow a number of in-house software developers in government departments, building solutions, internally at a fraction of a price normally charged. The government employee housing scheme was established after the negotiations between the employer and labor, which culminated in the Public Service um, Council bargaining chamber resolution seven of 2015. The purpose of the scheme is to assist government employees to access affordable housing through various interventions, including administration of housing allowance, facilitating access to affordable housing finance, facilitation of, of the provision of housing stock, enrolling uh, employees into the scheme in order to aggregate, aggregate demand and offer advice, education and counseling of employees with the aim of improving their chances of accessing uh, home ownership. House Chairperson, as at 31st March uh, 2022, Employees who are receiving a housing uh, allowance as homeowners has increased from 743,000 to 895 to 532,103 um, uh, in 2015. Um, Honorable House Chairperson, I wish to actually uh, thank uh, the DG and senior management of the uh, Department of Public Service and administration for the commitment they put in ensuring that access to basic social and economic service uh, economic services is possible for all South Africans. To all South Africans, I would like to say, Kaska Buoya Runa Setswana, Kere Musa Walu Nawa South Africa, Musa Walu Nawa South Africa, Musa Kim Musa Oli Ratang, Kim Musa Kana Koso Tota Dirangore, Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister. We will now call on Honorable Apleni to continue with the debate. Honorable Apleni. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, may I start by apologizing for the video? I mean, Dabangulu and Telecom Network is too bad here. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson. Can we just uh, I think see really you? Can we just see is it really you that is speaking? Just open for I, a moment. Yeah, but yeah, let's just let's see. Is it really? it, you are saying Hello? that just open the video for a for a moment so that you can see it's the real person. Oh, uh, it's me, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, you cannot doubt that. Uh, hello? Continue. Continue, please. Okay. 
Okay, Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, the EFF uh, rejects the budget votes uh, on uh, public services and administration. Uh, we rejected this uh, proposed budget vote for the same reasons we rejected the previous proposed budget votes, even if the ruling party refuses to admit it. The economic freedom fighters uh, were correct about the current state of collapse and incapacity of public services. Uh, South Africa currently stands as a country which lacks capacity incapable of responding to small everyday challenges faced by its own people. Why a state which stands shaking in the face of pandemics, our healthcare, our healthcare facilities such as hospitals, clinics, uh, could not respond to demands uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Honorable Chair, can you protect me, please? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, but you may continue. I will request Thank members to continue. Thank you, Chairperson. While a state which stands shaking in the face of pandemics, our healthcare facilities such as hospitals, clinics, could not respond to demands of COVID-19 pandemic. Instead, our people died, including our nurses and doctors. When floods hit KwaZulu Natal, disrupting the everyday life functioning of the province, the governing party lacks capacity to respond to roads, infrastructure, houses, and schools destroyed in Etequini municipality and other affected areas in Umlazi, Phoenix, Pine Town, and other affected areas because of the incapacity of the state. Our people in KwaZulu Natal are still waiting for water electricity, sanitation, and healthcare services uh, weeks after the floods. The living conditions of our people have been severely affected and it has taken a long time to recover as delayed actions and announcements have been the order of the day. We are a country that has no capacity we are a nation which has swayed so far away from the direction of economic development and our state capacity continues to deteriorate. For the former liberation movement has surrendered its developmental responsibility to private sector, which has on countless occasions demonstrated that it has no obligation to develop South Africa and has, has long proven this as, is as it is motivated uh, to bleed us dry of our resources. Government has failed to increase skills levels and failed to create jobs or tackle poverty. So much so that our country stands far removed from, from any conception of developmental state. Our people are battling with poverty, unemployment and in inequality. Our state-owned entities are in a state of disaster, plagued by mismanagement and corruption. Corruption remains a serious challenge. It severely cripples the ability of the state to pursue its, com uh, its commitments to economic development by draining resources away from economic development goals. Uh, corruption has been institutionalized through deployed, uh, deployment of cadres throughout the government and public service training institution. This has resulted in poor management, higher levels of financial and administrative corruption. I was so surprised when the previous speaker just before me was denying this fact. It's a fact uh, that cadre deployment is killing our country. Cater deployment has worsened problems related to corruption, poor procurement systems, wasteful expenditure, and the deteriorating state of all of our local government. It contributes to a state of disaster or chaos in local government stands as a threat in realizing developmental goals, objectives in all spheres of the economy. Jefferson, 
What we need is a shift to a capable state which will improve the capacity of the work used in its capacity I'm sorry, to drive Honorable, local... Can you please mute? Mm. Hello, ma'am? No, someone was speaking and I saw it, Honorable Lamskarni. I was just asking her to mute so that we can... You that so that there shouldn't be disturbance. You can continue. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, what we need is a shift to a capable state which will improve the quality of work and use its capacity to drive local administration and development of the economy. A shift to a developmental state with state capacity which will be able to intervene and stop the killings, kidnappings, and abduction of women and children as parents are losing and bearing their children on a weekly basis. What we need is a shift to a capable state which will improve the quality of work, use its capacity to drive local industrialization and development of the economy. A developmental state which will have the capacity to ensure reliable electricity generation water and sanitation, and able to build key institutions such as hospitals and clinics for our people. Our public service, therefore, must have its own capacity. And this is going to start by building state capacity and insourcing workers. We know insourcing is practical and implementable because they did in the city of Johannesburg, in Chwane, in Nelson Mandela Bay, at SARS and many other state institutions that have listened to the EFF guidance. We need to train public servants so that they are dependable and the National School of Governance must build its own capacity. We must increase their salaries to an acceptable standard, starting with our doctors, teachers, nurses, uh, right through the cashier workers who are currently earning 3,500 in retail stores and embarrassment for a country like ours. All uh, temporary workers and interns employed in state in institutions must be hired on a permanent basis with benefits and pensions. Uh, that must happen. All government employees who are doing businesses with the state must be given 30 days to leave businesses or leave the state. That's the choice they have. If they don't want to leave their businesses, they must leave the state. Unless we recognize public services according to these implementable proposals, we will not support this budget as the EFF. I hope uh, uh, the deputy minister was speaking with me was not ejected into South Africa last night. Because anyone who has been a, a citizen of this country knows very well that K that deployment is destroying our country. Thank you very much, Shepherdson. Honorable Apleni, thank you. Then we continue and we call on the Honorable M. De Brain. We continue with the debate. Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair. I'm also requesting that my video stays off. Um, I don't have a problem with bandwidth, but my device's webcam seems not to be working today. I don't know what's wrong. May I continue? Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair. The Department of Service and Administration should be ensuring effective service delivery on basic services. But as seen, uh, as seen year after year, service delivery is the last thing that is prioritized by this department and the agency government. Instead, unrealistic and sky-high wage bills are rather seen as priority number one. And because of gated deployment and political agendas, that are seen to have that unqualified and inexperienced staff, that staff and officials are being appointed, this department and every other department under its oversight has deteriorated into yet another bottomless pit of corruption and failure under the ANC. Service delivery in every department under the oversight of this department is at an all-time low, and the taxpayers are the ones that are spilling on the short end. The minister stated that the fight against corruption are being prioritized, but unfortunately, no one in South Africa has seen this so far. If this was actually the case, where are all the corrupt staff, officials, and politicians that we should have seen in orange jumpsuits by now? And if this department truly prioritized the fight against corruption, every province in South Africa would have had a dedicated prison for corrupt officials and politicians by now. Regarding the mandate of labor relations, in conditions of service and employee practices, this department has also failed miserably. 
And this is evident by the countless number of public service strikes over the last couple of years. Countless strikes that disrupted service delivery even further and that cost them millions in damages. In short, Honorable Chair, this department isn't living up to a single one of its mandates. There is no service delivery. There is no labor relations. The health and wellness of employees aren't taken seriously. Integrity, ethics, and anti-corruption is non-existent. And the improvement and effectiveness of public services is a joke. Deputy Chair, this department is failing in every aspect of its mandate. And it will continue to do so until a real effort is being made to appoint quality and experienced staff and officials. And when consequence management are taken seriously and persons guilty of corruption are being placed behind bars. See, this will only start to take effect after the 2024 elections, when the ANC has lost its majority and a coalition government takes over. And until then, this department, this budget cannot be supported. Thank you. We continue and we call on Honorable Bosho. Honorable Bosho, for the chair. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair. Um, I am of the opinion that government is not taking seriously the demands being made by unions on behalf of public servants regarding the increase in the public sector wage negotiations, which, if not addressed, could see many unions instructing their members to lay down tools and bringing the public sector to a complete standstill, which the governing party can sorely afford. The demands being made are way above consumer inflation rates. Inflation rates have always been built into the structure of wage adjustments in the past. Previous negotiations were an enlaged on as the governing party won the court battle, which has now led to the unions changing their outlook regarding their proposals on how remuneration will be negotiated going forward. Unions will now only negotiate wage adjustments for a single year. Past experiences have taught them that to enter into a multi-year wage negotiation with government has cost them and their members dearly, breaking the trust they once had with the governing party. In 2006, the number of employees in the public sector were 1.2 million, with a wage bill of 154 billion. In 2022, it stands at 1.3 million employees and a wage bill of, listen to this, 682.5 billion. Their pay is tripled in the last decade, which is ludicrous to say the least, especially in light of the high levels of poverty being experienced by the majority of our citizenry. We are all aware that government has rejected the demand by the public sector trade unions for a 10% hike this year, <clears throat> sorry, which would have cost the fiscus a whopping 49.2 billion money this government does not have. We have, however, see unions like the Federation of Unions of South Africa, one of the largest federations in the country, already warning government about a possible collision course with workers getting agitated over low wages. They feel that public servants are being treated unjustly and given a raw deal due to government not implementing the last leg of the multi-term wage agreement, Resolution 1 of 2019. Furthermore, public service unions are adamant that they need to see a 10% pay hike as they are emboldened by rising inflation, food prices soaring, fuel and transport costs increasing due to inter alia the Russian-Ukraine war, and the levies imposed on fuel prices. Honorable Deputy Chair, we need clear and decisive actions from the minister on how this party will address this issue to eliminate the state being held hostage by a public sector. As government and the unions are aware that Treasury has committed not to award public servant inflation-related wage increases as it needs to bring down the wage bill to more affordable levels, talks and negotiations, which are set again to start in July and end in September 2022, are going to need a tough stance by the Minister to show that government is serious in cutting down on the public wage sector bill to furthermore ensure that this country does not find itself in a more pernicious debt crisis. Your limits will be tested and how you act on them 
will be the deciding factor for future negotiations, Honourable Deputy or Acting Minister. Please, Minister, do not follow in the steps of the previous Minister, Ayanda Dodlo, who recently saw it fit to award a 450 million salary increase for millionaire managers in the public service. This was definitely an insult to the nearly 12 million unemployed South Africans and the private sector who at long last were acknowledged by the president in his SONA debate in February 2022 as the creators of jobs. The country is watching these negotiations with an eagle eye and 2024 is around the corner where your decision will be the catalyst of this country seeing the voting in of a multi-party coalition government with a majority party, namely the DA, who has a proven management track record, taking this country forward to break the chain of poverty and create employment and equality for all the people of South Africa. I uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Bosho. We will continue now and we will call on the Honorable Hadebe to continue with the debate. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Acting Minister, the Department of Public Service and Administration has one of the most challenging mandates in government. The mandate to improve the, <clears throat> the mandate to improve prof professionalization of the public service is important for setting an example of greater societal behavior and how our government conducts its business in terms of e ethics. Over the last few years, we have seen unprecedented economic struggles and a severe spike in unemployment. The global COVID-19 pandemic has brought about additional stress to our employment and economic development. Unfortunately, if we are honest, we have been experiencing an overall rate of decline for several years. The lasting effects of corruption within our public sector and the slow response to root, uh, to root out the additional fraud and maladministration. Public confidence in the government even before the looting and floods in KZN is at an all-time low, which has now branded South Africa as an open supporter of such ills. The lack of ethical leadership in our ruling party has tainted the image of our hard-fought democracy. The importance of the role of, of the Public Service Commission in overseeing, monitoring, and evaluating and <clears throat> investigating public administration public pub practices, as well as creating a capable, ethical, and developmental public service must be emphasized. The recent floods in Guazulu Natal and the Eastern Cape, so many lives lost, leaving many people destitute. The most disappointing discussion amongst the people who was their first concern regarding the mismanagement of relief funds allocated towards mitigating the devastation. The Minister of Public Transport, with nowhere to maneuver, was forced to reveal that in just one entity, Prasa, there were some 3,000 ghost employees. This shows the extent of the rot within our public sector in which salaries were being paid under a fraudulent scheme, a scheme where foreign nationals, people with criminal records or fraudulent documents all received monies from the state. Additional insult <coughs> to injury, excuse me. Prasa is riddled with ill-conceived procurement processes that cost the taxpayers billions of friends. Prasa, as an example, with all its ills, still feels as if it is entitled to receive a bailout from the taxpayer. It is unacceptable that an entity of the public sector does not feel that it is not accountable to the public and does not need to meet profitability demands. It is equally unacceptable that the same entity be regaled with corruption and escape without serious sanction. Unfortunately, for the poor in South Africa, this suffering is not temporal. It is relentless and accumulated. The heartbreak manifests itself in their everyday struggles, while those who already have plenty 
get more. We further wish to emphasize the need for synchronization of all three levels of administration in order to achieve anti-corruption objectives. As the IFP, we support the budget and we will continue to work alongside the department to ensure that professionalization is truly fulfilled. The IFP supports the budget, Honorable Chairperson. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Hadebe. We continue with the debate and we call on the Honorable JJ Lant to continue with the debate now. Honorable Minister, Honorable Members. Honorable Moy Mang, I am going to start with you today. Since you serve as the chair of the select committee, and I fully agree that one of the most important assets for an organization can and must be the human capital. But I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to start by telling you how it should work with something as simple as renewing your driver's license. During the middle of May, I went to the Marshall Bay Municipality. On arrival, there was an official, Ms. Jody, Jody Isaacs, who stepped forward and greeted all the people who arrived. She was friendly. She had a proper knowledge of who needs to go where, what they need, and she immediately created a positive experience, not just for herself and for a municipality, but also for government in general. The same experience was given to people every step along the way with other staff, such as Ms. Kanameya and Ms. Mostert, and many others doing exactly what you and the minister spoke about. So, Honorable Minister, if you did your speech today and you referred to public servants, such as the Mossel Bay people that I mentioned above, you would have been applauded. They are dedicated, they are skilled, they are diligent, they are knowledgeable, and they are ethical. But unfortunately, they are by far a minority. A minority because the majority of public servants, and, and maybe we should stop using that broad term, there are true public servants and they deserve the title. And then there are cadres. Honest public servants do not need courses in ethical leadership, but cadres definitely need it. But ethics is within you. It lives within you. You cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but this old dog called the ANC is inherently corrupt. So no wonder those that they, are, they deploy, they are also corrupt. Honorable Mamarekhane, public servants are indeed the backbone, but our backbone now has cancer. Cancer brought in by your cadres, and the cancer has spread in every national department, national entity, provincial departments, and entities across provinces and local government. This ANC cancer has spread. That is why I had a little chuckle when the ANC deployed Kader, who chairs this select committee, proclaim the ANC leads and the ANC lives. You are leading us, but you are leading us down a path of no return. And you barely still live, since you are not just riddled with cancer, you are cancer itself. There is no one that argues with you that there were a system in place before 94 that only looked after parts of the country. But Honorable Moy Mang, you should be ashamed of how you and your caterful party has failed the youth of today. 28 years after the dawn of democracy, 80% of grade four-year-olds cannot read with comprehension. comprehension. How do you expect them to then compete in the job market and to add to the public service as you proclaim in this debate? It's definitely no laughing matter. But if you do want to make a joke about it, and there's maybe a little hint of truth, I assume you wanted to get these great fours to read at the level of ANC MPs. Finally, Honorable Minister, you refer to consequence management in dealing with the corrupt. Nobody believes you. Not a single person. Your party is corrupt. Your cadres that you deploy there are corrupt to the core. And as a country, we are fed up with the corrupt, you are dying as the ANC, and we, and history, will not really mourn you, and we will not really remember you fondly 
for what you have done to this beautiful country since the dawn of democracy. I do hope that we see the back of you very soon and that we, in the true sense of the word, get a competent public service freed from cadres that gets deployed from a central office who will only look after a party and not look after the citizens of this country. I thank you. Honorable Lon, thank you. We are continuing and we call now on Honorable Dango to continue with the debate. Honorable Dango. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, it's a bit difficult to follow after Lon. It would, be, it would have been easier to follow under Honorable Tim because at least he makes an argument. He doesn't rant. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister, oh, Honorable Deputy Minister, Honorable Chief Whip, Honorable Members. The Public Service Commission is a constitution uh, body responsible for the promotion of values and principles in the public service, including promoting of a high standard of professional ethics and to propose measures to ensure effective and efficient performance within the public service. As the NDP suggests, we need to continuously strengthen the role of the Public Service Commission in championing norms and standards in the public sector. The Public Service Commission is assigned an advisory and oversight role, which includes promoting values of the public service and investigating breaches of procedure. To fulfill this role, the Public Service Commission needs to be a robust champion of a meritocratic public service with a strong, a strong oversight role. What would intensify the role of the public service even further is if we were to require departments to respond to the recommendations that have been put forward by the Public Service Commission. They in turn will then improve accountability in the state. Part of the challenges that we experience in the public service is a lack of practices such as conducting businesses within the state, corruption, the lack of transparency, are some of the critical issues that we face as a government. Chairperson, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, however, as indicated, the ANC has aimed to deal with such challenges in all three spheres of government, and work has been done in the provinces to mitigate these challenges. We hope that provinces will fast track their good governance strategies, particularly those provincial departments that have been implicated in matters of corruption. Honorable members, we must uproot all forms of corruption as it impedes the credibility of the government as the ANC, we must lead the moral regeneration of our country, and we must mobilize communities and society around the issues of corruption. We encourage members of the public to utilize the anti-corruption hotline to report any incidents of corruption in the public service. We acknowledge and recognize that there are consequence management measures in place to deal with public servants that have been implicated in, in corrupt practices or the breaching of the code of conduct. We hope that more stringent consequence management measures will be put in place to deter public servants and officials from committing such acts. Corruption undermines good governance, which includes sound institutions and the effective operation of the government in South Africa. In a democracy, it is crucial for political leaders and for public officials to account to the citizens for their actions. Transparency increases the already implemented uh, things. And I'm glad that Honorable Tim has acknowledged that there is, that the ANC has put into place the link necessary to take these things forward. But what he complains about is the implementation thereof. What we all need to do collectively him, I, and the rest of South Africa is to ensure that we all implement uh, these measures. Honorable Chairperson, the NDP 
sets out the criteria in obtaining an accountable state. And as such, the ANC, we are adamant in building an accountable state through the building of a resilient anti-corruption strategy, which was adopted from 2020, in which government has implemented strengthening accountability, responsibility of public servants, which have been implemented through stringent consequence management and the conducting of lifestyle audits. Transparency is an important element of public accountability. The satisfaction about the lack of access to information on service is prominent in, in, in protest. Section 32 of the Constitution enshrines the right to information. The Batupela principle state that the government should inform citizens about the services that they are entitled to and the government administration must be open and transparent. The Public Service Commission must continue to promote values, principles of the public service that ensure the public servants fully embody the Baltapella principles, in which is a people-centered government and must continue to make recommendations for public servants to state uh, wh what they're doing and where they're doing it. Uh, as an example, I would like to see the Batupela principles in every police station prominently displayed and in other areas where the public goes into and where they have access to, to that where there's public display of what those principles are. Without a reliable and honest, efficient court system, there can be no access to justice, no confidence on the part of the investors in the economy into the prospect of holding powerful and private actors into account. Now, also understand that private actors uh, play a large role in, in some of the issues that we may have uh, and pe what people may uh, perceive to be wrong. We therefore commend our judiciary for actively engaging and dealing with matters of corruption decisively. And as the ANC government, we will continue to fight for the independence of our judiciary system through improving the quality of judges and upscaling judicial training. Honorable members, building a capable and developmental state encapsulates a whole arena of actors, and they are all interlinked. It requires a capable government with capacitated human resources able to drive government's transformation agenda. It requires a government that will actually use the intervention of the state to deal with the challenges of the country, that of an unequal society and to bring all people and to bring all stakeholders and to, to benefit from the state. I want to just turn to some experiences that I've had somewhere else. There is a uh, organ called the Oslo Freedom Forum. And the Oslo Freedom Forum trained young people and others into conducting and undertaking what they then called the color revolutions in North Africa. They also trained the activists in Hong Kong. And make no mistake, Ukraine was started in 2014 when they trained the people there to go on a color revolution there. My question is, who in South Africa has been trained on a color revolution? And are people planning a color revolution? Because there's one, you know, if you, if you had a, 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 a PVC record that was stuck, it said 2024, 2024, 2024. That is all we're hearing here is come 2024. Now, Google said, if you replay, repeat the lie often enough, it may become the truth. So maybe those that are repeating 2024, want that to become the truth. It will not become the truth, of course. You won't be here in 2024. You'll be retired. That's fine. I won't. I don't intend to be anywhere. Um, in, um, he's but, struggling to pronounce 2024 because he's so used to 1652. Uh, yeah, please, but, Lord, please. You know, the problem is really started but, in 1652, please. which of Honorable Lond will deny. He will deny that uh, a person called Van Viber came in, robbed the poor people in the Cape of their land raped and stole. He will deny that that happened. It never happened in his view. 
But that is where it started. And when we say, you know, this building that I see behind me, the parliament building, is our heritage. Yes, it is our collective heritage. But when they break down the graves of the Hoi and the Sun in Salt River, that is also our, our heritage. Be as concerned about the Hoi and Sun heritage as we are about our collective heritage be behind us. Um, I've gone away from what I intended to say, but I just hope that the, re the repeat of 2024 is not those that have been trained to uh, undertake a color revolution. Color revolutions bring blood. Make no mistake and be careful. And when you're saying you have these alliances, I have listened to two of the possible alliance partners here today. And the one says, we pay too much. And the other one says, we pay too little. But they're going to form an alliance. Honorable Deputy Speaker, our transformation agenda should always respond to the triple challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. Minister, carry on with the good work. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Dango. We will now call on We will now call on the Honorable the Minister to conclude the debate. Minister Nesi. Thank you, Chairperson. I hope you've counted my minutes, which I didn't finish for the first time. <laughs> on, on, Honorable Brett, Brett and sir, you raised an important uh, bra, issue bra, of good policies. Bra, but uh, the poor implementation in some areas is a problem. I think uh, that's fair. This is an issue which you must address indeed. I take this as constructive criticism. We must definitely, all of us, as some of the speakers have said, we must deal with uh, corruption from both the public and the private sector because there's a corruptor and a corruptee private sector should not be spared here. But I can't agree with the honorable member when he accuses the ANC of the CADA deployment, which is exactly what they did um, when they came to Cape Town, leading what I would call the white CADA deployment. The, A, the first thing which they did when they were in Cape Town, when they took over, was to remove the well-respected community leader, Dr. Wallace Ngoka, because he was black. They continued with their terror of removing black people with their white cadres. But they are accusing us of cadre development. They have been doing it, and they are continuing to do it. And you are taking the country back by ensuring that you protect the white apartheid inherited privileges. It cannot be accepted. Exchanges between Tony Leon and some of his supporters like Mike Waters in the Twitter with the mayor Palazzo of Johannesburg speaks for itself. You only want the black people for votes only. You do not want to give them space and respect to lead. Where are the Maimanes? Where are the Mazimbos? Where are the Malintulis? Where are the Fandames? Many others are still following once we have used them. Maybe Man Masela is also following. Let me thank the honorable members um, for their contribution in the debate, those who have contributed positively. We will take some of the inputs into consideration, but we'll leave all the illogical, unsound, and unreasoned groundless noise by the EFF. They've never supported anything. But also let me ask, who is the DA to talk about labor relations for public sector workers when they have and continue all the years arguing for deregulated labor market? Do you want it for the public sector, but oppose it? Oppose it for the private sector, where there's super exploitation in some of the sectors. As we speak, it is the private white employers who, <laughs> who 
who in, in the farms are employ, employing foreign nationals without any benefit and distorting the labor market by exploiting those desperate economic refugees. You take us back by your apartheid practices, by treating the, the workers as slaves, but we have the audacity to come here and talk about the government bargaining processes, which has been stable. When it's you hardly say record. anything, when you hardly say anything about the slave conditions in your farms, we cannot accept that. With that, uh, Chairperson, Deputy Chairperson, we are moving forward where uh, people are constructive. But if people are starting to take us back, we are going to hit back very hard. Thank you. Thank you very much. You could be the only one clapping, eh? I don't know. Damn them! <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, they be, uh, uh, Chief Whip, they are allowing you to be the only one to applaud the Honorable the Minister. The problem is that I've got different guides, so I'm looking for the final one before I can continue to, to, uh, to conclude the business of the day. But with that, I want to conclude the business of the day. The two... Uh, budget vote debates that was today vote uh, two as well as the one on public servant public service and administration as well as the one on uh, what is it public service and administration national school of governance and public service commission that was the debate that was concluded just recently let me thank the, the acting minister. Let me also thank the deputy minister, the MECs, also the deputy speaker of the Eastern Cape in the vote to debate, special and permanent delegates, the chairperson, the chief whip, those that participated in, in both the debates. Let me express our appreciation for a constructive debate, sometimes not so constructive, but we have concluded the business of the day. And after thanking everyone, let me adjourn the house. Thank you. Same time tomorrow, God willing. Good night. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Recording stop. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, Thank you. Deputy Minister. Mama, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thank you, advocate. Thank you, colleagues. Bye. Thank you, advocate. Thank you, colleagues.